Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 212th video cast podcast for the week ending November 9th, 2023. A lot to cover today. Uh, special guest, John Najarian. Anyone who's watched financial television in the last 20 years knows John, so we're going to get into that in a little bit. But as we get started, let's do a little catch up on the photos. Uh, this is Annabelle here uh, in our billiard room. She's holding her CT16 award, top 10 in the country. She's one in the country for backstroke, but we went out to Ch uh, central Connecticut somewhere uh, on Sunday. And while she was getting that award, uh, Mimi was up in Boston. That's her with her friend Zadie at the Boston Tea Party reenactment. They were at Harvard for a special high level training camp tryout uh, thing for water polo. That's them. No taxation without representation, throwing the tea overboard. Uh, obviously got some genetics from me. That's them in the Harvard pool. So uh, planting some seeds for later. That's her with her uh, coach there. Uh, going through some different programs. It's it's unbelievable to see. She's 11 years old and uh, just just rocking and rolling. So proud of them. Moving on, that was, uh, got some uh, photos from Alexa Mead. That was Mimi giving her the uh, gift. And Alexa Mead, we showed you that a couple weeks back. The Wonderland thing that she did, the installation on Fifth Avenue was absolutely amazing. And um um, I think, you know, every time I see the website and artwork, and she's been so nice to our daughters of Alexa Mead, I have this fear of loss somehow that, and I'm not an art guy, so, you know, listen to me about stocks, not about art, but I have this strong feeling somehow I'm missing the next Banksy. Uh, it, it just... I just have an instinct, you know, Banksy understood the commercial aspect of art, I think Alexa totally understands that. So uh, I don't know what her next, next project's going to be, but definitely uh, follow her website. Here are some pictures from in-studio when I went to do the Clayman Countdown with Liz Clayman this week. Very exciting, give you kind of an inside view of what the studio looks like. This is different from the one that Charles uses. This is going into the green room, kind of give you a, a, a background view of uh, the News Corp building there. That's another picture there. And then this is outside, which you've seen a few times before. And then uh, this was Florida. Uh, went down a friend of mine in uh, has a premium finance company. For those of you insurance brokers out there, uh, they do an incredible job. One of the top three in the country. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, obviously comes down to service value uh, and everything they do. If you are in that business, reach out to me. I'll connect you. It's definitely someone you want to meet. And uh, that was the sunset. We held the board meeting. Want to thank Jeff M for holding the uh, board meeting at his house right on the beach in Boca Grande, uh, GRA. I call it Grande. They call it Grand. I'm not sure which one it is, but it's this gorgeous island off of the west coast of Florida, between kind of equidistance between Fort Myers and um, Sarasota, and. Uh, which worked out perfectly. I met uh, Paul S. was amazing. A client of mine got to meet. Uh, uh, he came up from Naples and we had a great lunch in Fort Myers. And then I met with uh, Jim R., who's coming on board in Sarasota. Uh, we had an incredible time. He came down from Tampa. And then I went over to this place just to give you an idea um, how well the insurance brokerage business is these days in terms of the multiples these things are trading for. This thing, the guest house, uh, had six full bedrooms and bathrooms, uh, and the main house was probably about double or triple, all beachfront, absolute amazing time. So thanks to Jeff M for hosting. Bill V is my buddy who, who runs and owns the company, unbelievable time. And then uh, uh, obviously Ke Kevin M, awesome time meeting and playing golf with you, Dave A, Mike R, uh, uh, and Kevin B. We, we just had an incredible time. So uh, that was that. Went to a, by the way, if you're in that town, incredible restaurant called Temptations. Uh, it's like 100 years old. 
you'll see when you go in uh, exactly why and all, all the, the history behind it. Best burrata I've ever had in my life. And I'm a burrata guy, I grew up in Jersey, so I know my Italian stuff. And uh, this was absolutely phenomenal. And the pan fried red snapper is to die for. And I know some of you are in that neighborhood, so you're gonna take me up on that. Uh, definitely wanna do that. And then, um, let's go over here. Oh, also got to play Coral Creek over there, thanks to Jeff M. Uh, great time at that course. Uh, then I went across the state after the board meeting and meeting with clients and uh, new clients went over to Pine Tree on in Boynton Beach on the East Coast, which was unbelievable. Um, this is a plaque here that it shows Sam Sneed was a member his whole life. It was his favorite course in the South. He's quoted as saying, uh, that was the beachfront views over there. Let's see, okay. And then this was absolutely incredible. So this is the clubhouse of Pine Tree. This is Mike Bennett, who I told you about. He invented stack and tilt uh, swing system in golf with Andy Plummer. And then this is Gene Mulak, who taught me how to play golf, who's a stack and tilt instructor. And just playing ball, you know, Mike is considered one of the, uh, one of the, if not the best ball striker in golf, but certainly one of the best ball strikers in golf. And like, it's just everything he hits is pure baby draws all day long, like a machine. And he completely embodies his work. And, you know, Gene took me from this ball of clay, turned me into someone that could, you know, swing a golf club and play golf. And, and Mike is chipping away to make it actually look like a beautiful uh, statue here. And uh, I'll show you some of the, the results of that. Uh, and then we'll get down to it. And then our incredible host. So Gene Mulak, unbelievable. By the way, best golf balls in, in, in golf, clear golf. Um, he, he works for them and their shafts. I'm gonna try their shafts. Uh, and Mike Bennett invented second tilt. And this is Ryan P who hosted us at Pine Tree, uh, which was just an incredible time. What an incredible gentleman, brand new friend. And uh, it's gonna be a friend for a long time. So uh, uh, great, great day. Uh, and thanks for Gene for setting all that up and everything else. This is when you come into Pine Tree. So it was, it was really just fun. And this is uh, Mike sent me some pictures and then we'll get to it. Uh, you know, if I ever break 80, it's going to turn into hedge fund tips and golf tips with Tom Hayes. But uh, uh, I did break 43 times this year, but I haven't pulled it together for this season. Rather, I haven't pulled it together for uh, two nines to break 80. But, you know, first full year last year I started, uh, but I was restricted this year was my first full year playing. Uh, so this is, he's got, Mike's got my follow through going well. And every time I have an epiphany, uh, I turn back and I say, yeah, Gene taught me that the first lesson. Gene taught me that the second lesson. Gene taught me that the third lesson, but it's getting reminded. I uh, got the nice tilt going here. Um, and uh, these are from Mike. He sent them over to me to show me like, you're doing a lot right, my man. And he shows this, uh, all these pros here. And then uh, that's Mike demonstrating and so on and so forth. So and that's the book, that's Mike on the front. And by the way, I went to uh, Google him. You can actually, they have a copy on their website. If you Google stack and tilt uh, book, uh, you can download the whole PDF here and that's him on the front, see the follow through. Uh, or if you can't find it, just reach out to me at info at hedgefundtips.com and I'll send it to you. And Mike's by the way, got this incredible um, you know, when we first met, he thought I was in private equity. So he was telling me he's affiliated with this group. And now KKR is a big client because, uh, and Warburg, because they use it across all of their portfolio companies. It's just adding like two to three to 5% EBITDA for no additional costs. And, and basically they have some special program where if you run a business or if you are, or if you're in private equity, because I know there are some private equity guys that listen to this uh, uh, podcast, um, and you own businesses that process a lot of credit cards, it doesn't have to be a lot. You know, it could be you know half a billion, it could be a hundred million, it could be three million. But um, somehow they they um, created some system where they can just like basically cut those costs down by a third to a half without any cost to the to the proprietor of the business, uh, and they get paid on the amount that they save the business owner or 
in the case of KKR and um, uh, Warburg, uh, they, they get paid on the amount that they save across all the portfolio companies, which adds up to millions and millions of dollars. And then you think about the multiple on those millions of dollars of increased EBITDA, it's an extremely valuable service. So if any of you have businesses that you want to increase your EBITDA with no out-of-pocket costs, I'll connect you on that front. And then we're going to kick it off to uh, the uh, Fox Business on Tuesday. I joined Liz Clayman. want to thank Liz Clayman. want to thank Catherine Myers, Jake Mack for putting me on. We're going to go into this one because I talked about a, a major turnaround company that we touched on in last week's article, talked about market outlook and, uh, and so on. So let's listen in here. Great moves. So let's get right to the floor show. Joining me now, our floor show traders, John Najarian and Tom Hayes. John, what do you make of this eight-day NASDAQ streak, and how long do you think it lasts? Well, um, you've had a, a very nice move out of the leader, the biggest capitalized stock in the world, Apple, um, despite the fact that there aren't exactly bunting or banners being put up for the new iPhone 15. Despite that, Liz, uh, this one continues to drive higher. Uh, that helps lift the NASDAQ. Your 28% move out of data dog that you accurately said, number one in the kennel, number one in my heart, Liz. Uh, <laughs> other, other than you, okay, it's number two in my heart behind you. But this is a phenomenal report. Uh, like you said, 25% growth year over year nice. um, and great guidance going forward, Liz. True. Yeah. Let's not forget the guidance. But when you bring in the voices of the Fed heads, we have three of them speaking here. And, and Tom, when you look at what Governor, Fed Governor uh, Christopher Wallace said specifically, he was out there today trying. It, it almost felt like he was dashing the hopes of people who were thinking that inflation is on its way to being slayed and that we go back to prices like old times. He said, quote, what people have in mind now is for prices to return to earlier levels. That's not going to happen. And then we had uh, Michelle Bowman, a Fed governor, and then the Dallas Fed, Lori Logan, yeah. president there. They're both saying, hey, you know what? We could see another rate hike at some point. Yeah, and I, I think Logan, though, did acknowledge that we're sufficiently restrictive right now. So if you're a short seller, what you need to know right now into year end is the beatings will continue until morale improves because <laughs> at the end of the day, they, they all came into earnings season super high, high up in cash. They were short long-term bonds and uh, expectations were super low, negative 40 basis points of earnings growth. Now we're at plus 3.7% earnings growth with 12% earnings growth the next year. So you got to look for opportunities. Yes, we've gone straight up. We might consolidate a little bit, but I think the path of least resistance into year end is going to be up. John, what about those bears and the ones who had, as Tom says, <laughs> gone short. A lot of hedge funds were short. They've gotten squeezed, certainly. They're, they're counting out this market. But you've been able to identify certain opportunities where people should be bearish. Where are you bearish right now? Um, believe it or not, we're still bearish on many of the automakers, but Ford in particular, Liz, um, had a lot of speculative cash flowing in on the put side, which, as you know, is an insurance policy or a bet that the market goes lower. And they were buying an in-the-money put in the case of Ford. So that means that uh, they didn't think that it was just going to fall. They wanted to participate basically dollar for dollar to the downside in Ford. And all of these automakers have taken on a lot more cost, Liz, because of what has happened uh, with uh, uh, the new contracts that they've signed, mm -hmm. perhaps very deserved, but nonetheless, that cuts into profitability. Yeah, it's a $10.09 stock right now. Uh, annual yep. low here was about $9, let me just check it, $9.63. Ford, I, I mean, what can you say? I, I want to see that company succeed. I, I love the big I autos here in the U.S., but mm -hmm. where are you long, John? Um, well, you mentioned about that 4% drop for light, sweet, crude. Um, we had unusual activity in several airlines, but JetBlue, $4.30 this morning. They came in buying upside calls that expire on Friday, Liz. So it's not a lot of time to be right, but nonetheless, um, they're buying this Friday and next Friday calls. They think the stock goes higher, and this is their biggest cost is jet fuel. And the fact that crude oil is down... I think you'll start seeing some more bets 
come in on the airline stocks. Interesting point. Yes. Everything is interwoven, isn't it, Tom? So let me talk mm -hmm. about where you see real <laughs> opportunity right now, because like you said, short sellers just keep getting their Tuchus is smacked. <laughs> yeah, so they were re record short the 10 year. And what's happened is 10 year yields have collapsed down to 455 as of today, which is, what's going to happen is peak rates narrative is going to permeate, which means companies with a little leverage on their balance sheet got, that got hammered are now going to be able to rebound. Two big, big time turnaround stories. Number one is VF Corp. People are probably oh, wow. having a tough time with, with this one. Daryl Bracken is the new CEO. He came from. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. Hold that thought yeah. because this is the parent company of Vans, yep. Timberland, yep. the North Face, a yep. bunch of these yep. apparel companies, yep. and, and they got. Hammered, hammered recently, a terrible quarter. North Face is up, Vans is down, that's their problem. Europe is up, U.S. is down. China and Asia are up, U.S. is a problem. However, when he came into Logitech, the stock was down 82% in 2013. He turned the company around. It was a 26 bagger by 2021. If you invested $5 million, you made $133 million. Mil oh, my God. He's going to turn around this company. We're, we're confident in his ability to look, do look, so. Look, here, here's the Logitech screen. When he was, when, when did he become CEO there? 2013. The stock wow. was down 82%, just like VF Corp is right now. Mm -hmm. He delevered. He got the business going. He's doing the exact same thing. He fired the uh, president of Vans. He's putting in a new president of Vans. He's uh, selling the PACS business, Jansport, East PAC. He's going to delever the balance sheet, and he's going to transfer Let's the show VF Corp again, because the, uh, I yeah. mean, do you think that's a gutsy play? Would you would you be along that one, John? Or and if not, which which apparel companies, retail companies, look like they could do well this holiday season? Well, uh, LVMH always, Liz. <laughs> that, that would luxury. be my pick because, <laughs> yeah, luxury uh, doesn't know anything about recessions. Yeah. But uh, I think Tom's on a very good run here with VF Corp. Um, picking up a stock in, the, in a market that looks like it's going from the lower left to the upper right, I think this one uh, in particular with the deleveraging that he described, I think that's a good bet at this level, Liz. Let me just mention something in Techland. Microsoft. Microsoft is on track for a record close. You got any names mm -hmm. in technology world? Yeah, we own uh, Amazon. We bought last fall when no one wanted tech, and we own Alphabet, which we also bought last fall when no one wanted tech. We like we like turnaround stories. You know that, Liz. We like to buy things that are unpopular, and when they get popular, we lay, we'll lay them off. Okay, uh, that's, <laughs> that's that's what you guys have discipline, both yeah. of you. I don't know how you do it, but yeah. <laughs> John, Tom, thank you both very much for being our floor show thank traders you. today. And we're back. And the other interesting thing is I was able to connect with John Najarian, as you saw, he was the guest, uh, and he agreed to come on as a special guest for this week's podcast. Uh, and I got to do a good 15, 20 minute segment. And one of the things we've touched on from time to time is unusual options activity. And that's an area that he is an expert. So uh, we're gonna listen to this short uh, 15 minute interview I did with John and take a listen. Well, I'd like to welcome John Najarian. Anyone who's turned on financial TV over the last two decades knows who John Najarian is. John, it was so great being on Fox Business with you, the claim and countdown on Tuesday. I really enjoyed that and glad we got to connect. Uh, you know, you've got such a varied background. You're a professional football player. You were a yes. floor trader. Uh, you co-founded and sold an incredible brokerage called Options Monster. And of course, the TV career has been prolific. So could you tell us a little bit about your background? And then I want to get into some uh, great questions on options. I know your specialty is unusual options activity, uh, but, but uh, tell the audience about yourself. Well, thanks very much, Thomas. Um, it, it was great being on with you. Uh, Tom and I connected folks because... Um, I thought he made a great case for uh, VF Corp, um, which, as he said, um, has the, the former head of Logitech as part of it. And I just thought it was a well-reasoned uh, description as to why you would buy that stock. This guy's done it before. Um, he turned a company around that makes the peripherals that we all use, you know, whether it's a wireless mouse or whatever, keyboards and so forth, that was Logitech. And now VF Corp, which has uh, been accumulating a lot of brands, but some of those brands, like you said, Tom, the uh, Vans, for instance, V-A-N-S, um, it, it certainly connects with an audience and they get, for the most part, a premium 
for what is effectively a flipper. <laughs> but um, perhaps some of the people that were running it um, were running it a little looser than the gentleman who's now in charge intends to run it. And so, like I said, I thought you made some great points there. Um, as far as my background, just as you said, um, I came to the markets in Chicago after I washed out as a football player for the Bears. It was fun to be there, but it was even more fun to be on the floor and getting my foot in the door there. Uh, I think like a lot of us in this industry, if you weren't born into the Rothschilds or uh, the Coens or whatever it might be, um, you have to fight to get onto a trading floor. And I basically worked for free for six months, uh, yeah. no money at all. But I did uh, live with two other traders and so cut my expenses pretty dramatically. And then as the light bulb came on and I finally understood what was going on with derivatives options, um, it became much more fun. But the first six months weren't all that fun. <laughs> yeah, no, no question. And I think that's an important message because I have a lot of younger people also that listen to the, the podcast uh, that you were willing to work for free for six months. Uh, you know, don't take a job for what you'll get paid. Take a job for who you'll become. Work with people you like and respect and want to become like one day. Uh, and I think that's a, a rare trait nowadays, John, in that, uh, you know, the expectations and kind of the entitlement uh, culture is very high. And, and it really sells people short that could have incredible careers because they're not willing to put in the grit and the time and the determination like you did, like I did. I grew up as a golf caddy. Uh, washing dishes when I was 10, newspaper routes, you, you know the drill. Uh, yeah. And you just, you know, you make it happen. You work hard. Uh, you got to be smart. That's table stakes, but you, you got to go after it. And, um, uh, and and now you're running, you're co-founder at Market Rebellion. I know we're going to talk a little bit about that at the end. Um, I hope you'll, you'll share some of that. I, I want to go into sure. unusual options activity. I've got some questions that I think would be helpful for the audience and, and you could help educate. Um, what, you know, as it relates to unusual op options activity, you see a big volume, several thousand contracts. Uh, how do you think about that as signal versus noise? Um, well, uh, as your audience that doesn't trade options, uh, some of them, I want to just lay down that options, every option is on 100 shares of stock. So when somebody buys an option, folks, they are getting a leveraged potential return on their investment. So for instance, if Disney is trading at $90 where it was this morning, and you wanted to bet on the upside of Disney, you could buy a 90 strike call. That would give you a leveraged return because you could buy that depending how much time you want because options have expirations unlike stocks. So depending how much time you want. If you said, I think I'm gonna be right over the next three months, I'm gonna buy a three month out option right here at 90 bucks, we call that at the money. Um, if somebody does that, they get a leveraged return um, if they're right. Meaning that maybe they spent $4 for that option, every option's for hundred shares, so that's 400 per option, but they could turn that into uh, $10, $12, $15, which would be, of course, a thousand dollars at the ten dollar strike uh, or a ten dollar return, um, fifteen hundred at a fifteen dollar return, and uh, those kinds of leveraged returns are what we follow. We don't bet on people selling options because they sell options number one for cash flow, number two perhaps they're greedy and they just don't want to buy anything and they just want to sell a call or a put, and when they do that, that's all they can make is the yeah. amount that they collect in, as we call premium, just like an insurance policy. But if you are betting um, and buying that option, that's what we follow, Tom. We're yeah. following the people that are buying an option because of that leveraged return. And they give us time frame of when they think the event's gonna happen. And they give us a uh, strike price. In other words, where will that uh, uh, person buy that call option? Again, in Disney, if it's 90, and they're buying the 100 strike, they're telling me they think it's gonna pop towards 100 over the period of time that they've purchased. Is it a week, is it a month, is it a quarter? Depending on how far out they go. 
Yeah, that, that, that's really helpful. And I know a lot of the audience here is, is pretty experienced with options. So that's a, a, a great review. Speaking of Disney, that's one of our larger positions in terms of equity. And we have some long dated, deep in the money uh, leaps uh, overlay on top of that. Um, you know, and we, we weren't, weren't playing for earnings or anything like that. We're taking a 12 to 36 month view, similar with VF Corp and some of the other turnarounds that we do. Uh, did you see anything in the market? Because I know you look at this thing nonstop. Did you see any big volumes coming in ahead of earnings on either the put or the call side? Uh, did it give you any inkling that we were going to have such a positive outcome uh, overnight? Um, well, they, in particular, I'll say this. Uh, number one, I was extremely bearish on Disney up until about a month ago. And okay. the reason I was bearish was they were buying puts repeatedly. A put is a downside bet, folks. So they were repeatedly buying those puts, Tom. Yeah. Um, then, we, call that, we call that selling in the hole, my audience knows. <laughs> yep. Well, <laughs> they were. They were selling yeah. it in the hole. But it did collapse all the way from you know triple digits, over 100 a share, all the way down to $79 or $78. That's right. um, and I kept saying that uh, they're not creative. Um, you know, uh, Michael Iger gets a lot of credit um, because he spent a lot of money. He bought Marvel. He bought um, uh, Pixar and a host of other uh, companies, you know, the, the Lucas films and so forth with all the Star Wars stuff attached. Um, those were shrewd buys because of the catalogs, I thought, Tom. But yeah. he hadn't done anything creative in a very long time, except yeah. things that maybe half of your audience and half of mine hate, which are really woke things. I'm not going to judge. You know, if you want to buy a company that does woke stuff, go for it. I think your job as the head of a corporation is to maximize shareholder value. And if you go too far right or too far left, bang, um, I think you can hurt your shares. And Target has done just that. Disney did just that, and people shunned it. And now yeah. they've done what? His big creative move this time around uh, was to cut $4 billion more than people. I mean, we knew he was going to cut about $2 billion. Um, he did that. Then he added another $2 billion, and the, he's saying, you know, CapEx, in other words, how much am I going to spend on my theme parks, on movies, all the rest of the things that you could spend money on if you're Disney? We're... Cost reduction, that's probably the right thing to do. That doesn't make him creative. I mean, yeah. I remember yeah. a guy, I'm sure you do, named Chainsaw Al Dunlop. And yeah. Chainsaw would go in there and just slash uh, companies and just jettison parts of it and things like that. Disney hasn't jettisoned yet, but they will. They're going to jettison ESPN. You and I probably suspect the same. They'll yeah. get a premium when they do that. But... I don't think this is a terribly creative team at Disney. Nonetheless, right, yeah, yeah. Um, your question was, did we see strong, unusual activity? A little, not okay. a lot. I yeah. had no option position, only stock in Disney. And I should have bought more when it broke 80. Um, I did not. Um, but I thought we were going to see 71 to the downside. So I didn't yeah. add to my position. Um, but I wish I did, of course, now that it's 90. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, that happens. Sometimes the biggest moves are when no one expects them. Um, how do you discern when you look at the big volumes and unusual? Is there any way that you have to discern what is a directional position versus uh, a hedge position, either part of a spread or someone buying a ton of stock and then, um, you know, buying puts to, to hedge against it in the shorter intermediate term? Uh, do you have any special way of telling that? Um, well, uh, w it depends how quickly they're buying them. So okay. for instance, Tom and all of your listeners, viewers, um, if they're buying big blocks of options very quickly, meaning that maybe they buy 5,000 or 10,000, 5,000 yeah. would be 500,000 share equivalent, yeah. 10,000 is a million share equivalent. If they're yeah. buying those in a 10 minute period, it's yeah. somebody that thinks they're Bobby Axelrod. Somebody that thinks that they're Tom, that, you know, <laughs> has a very strong feeling that they want to follow. And they're afraid that if they wait, they could miss that move. Yeah. And they're going to scare people that no longer will sell them leveraged bets to the upside or downside. So that means a lot to us. We always talk about volume, 
velocity, and volatility. And the velocity, how quickly they buy them, is one of those uh, inputs that we think is really important, Tom. Okay, so if they're going big blocks quickly, that's a directional bet. And if it, and and by the way, very few people are going to have a million share equivalent. So if they had a million share, you know, that's a billion dollar position, and they're not going to be doing that in one block because they wouldn't have accumulated the the stock that quickly. So they would be, you know, buying hedges or puts over time as they're accumulating the the stock position. But that's a really great way to think about it. I think very helpful for a lot of people out there. I uh, want to get through a couple more questions, and then you know I know we've got a limit on this recording here, uh, and we're going to have you back because I'm I'm having fun cool. with this. Um, so, too. Uh, do you pay extra special attention to uh, any Greeks in particular, Delta, Theta, Vega, Gamma, Rho, or implied volatility, or, or are you just looking where's the volume because someone may know something that I don't, and I want to jump on with that. First trigger is volume. Yeah. Um, then it's velocity, how quickly did they buy them? And then yeah. it's volatility. Did they overcome the market makers, which for the most part are computers these days, they're algorithms that are putting up a bid and an offer. Um, and they're putting them up at almost the speed of light, those bids and offers. Yeah. So um, my answer would be when uh, the first thing that triggers is the volume, we see all of a sudden a large block of calls on the offer, again, if they're on the bid, we don't care. Could be a covered writer. Somebody perhaps like you um, who has held stock for a long time and yep. now you're selling calls to make a bigger return, turn that 4% dividend into a 20% dividend because yep. you're collecting call premium every month or every quarter or however often you choose to do it. So volume, then velocity, then volatility. Yeah. And you pay exclusively attention to more shorter dated. I was going to ask, is there more signal in the short term, high volume, high velo uh, velocity uh, options versus the long dated? Because we tend to traffic, particularly for uh, our investment management business and clients, you know, we'll own stock and then we'll take some, you know, have a small 10, 15 percent overlay on, you know, long dated in the money leaps on the same idea. Uh, wh where do you get the most juice? You're paying mostly attention to short term on those metrics? We are. We rarely see people putting on really big trades that are out more than six months. Yeah. Sometimes you do. Um, but right now, in particular, uh, you can kind of put the analogy to baseball players, um, how they shorten up their swing when they're not as certain, when they're not, I mean, if you're swinging from your heels, like, you know, perhaps the Texas Rangers were, you know, because they were just knocking the ball out of the park, they weren't shortening up on their swings at all. But if you're in a slump, you're shortening up your swing. People in the market do the same thing, um, and they shorten their swing because, for instance, the market opens up 200 for the Dow and finishes negative on the day, or vice versa. So it's really hard for them to put on a really big trade right away unless they have a high degree of confidence. So what they're looking for is they're gonna chip away and work their way into large positions and things like that, rather than going all the way in all at once. Um, and that's why I say they shortened up on their swing rather than just swinging from their heels. Um, you, you've felt it, I've felt it. I'm sure many of your listeners have felt it when you are really hitting it when you're making a lot of money and you're really reading the market right. They call it reading the tape and so forth. When you're doing that, you're probably trading as big as you'll ever trade. But yeah. when you've had a few that have gone against you, even if, or maybe even they're just small winners, but you were right on the direction and then it pulls back. Um, that's when you shorten up your swing and that's what we're seeing right now. Yeah, no question. Now, I got two questions, but before I, I do that, I, wanted, I want my viewers to know, uh, we all know about the incredible things that you've done uh, throughout your career. What are you doing right now? How can the viewers uh, get in touch with you or, or be a part of whatever you're involved in at the moment? Um, well, very kind of you. We have uh, marketrebellion.com, um, and it's our website uh, that uh, basically we publish all of our subscription information, the stuff you and I talked about on TV, for instance, um, as well as we have education. So we educate people on becoming uh, better investors, whether it's technical analysis or options. 
And if they hit market rebellion, um, they can see a lot of things they can sign up for for free. We'd love them to buy things, of course, but there's a lot of free things, including this thing that we call three at three, where we uh, put out three bits of unusual activity every day. Um, and we have specials all the time for that, where uh, it only goes out live to people that are subscribing. And that's a super cheap subscription. It's, I think, $37 a month or something like that. But we also give it away at various times. And we've got a book coming out, Tom. So we're about to give that three-month subscription away just for people that hit marketrebellion.com. So uh, you'll probably see a landing page there. That's exciting. What's your Twitter handle, by the way, as well? Um, my name, at J-O-N-N-A-J-A-R-I-A-N. Yes, I know because I follow you. I wanted everyone else to know. One last okay. question on, on the mechanics of the business, if we get a minute here, is, is there any truth to this Max Payne thesis that de dealers have a tendency to push the price of the underlying to the point at which most option holders will lose at expiration? So if you look around you know, the put volume and the, the call volume and the, the underlying price settling between the lumps of those two, you know, the highest volume of those two. Uh, and if there is any validity to that or that you've experienced or noticed over the years, how do you manage around that? I think uh, you and I might call that pin risk. Yeah. Meaning that wherever exactly. there's a large amount of calls or a large amount of puts, they tend to be magnetic and, uh, uh, it goes right to that level. I think one of the reasonable reasons or explanations would be that if somebody has a whole bunch of puts, they've been betting on the downside, um, and they have a whole bunch of puts at the you know 95 strike in Disney, for instance, um, it would be drawn to that strike rather than falling through the floor. Why? People are already short through the put purchase, and now as they go into expiration, they are selling those puts uh, because they can't take delivery on the short side of the stock. Uh, conversely, on the long side of the stock, if they're long a call, it tends to push it down to the strike. So both are pretty magnetic. Puts pull it up, calls push it down. And the reason is whoever you're selling that put to is buying stock against it to yep. lock in that little bit of edge. But if you're yep. selling 100,000 puts over the course of a couple of days, that's gonna lift the stock because an additional buyer of 100,000 shares, they're hedged because they own the puts. Same yeah. thing if you're selling calls, it's going to push that down to the strike because all of the people that are selling those calls, what am I doing when I'm buying it if I'm a market maker? I'm selling stock against yeah. those calls. So I'm yeah. pushing the stock down to that strike. To me, that makes more sense than um, a, uh, a superhero trader <laughs> that's uh, causing that uh, to narrow yeah. in on a single strike. Yeah, so it's just where the hedges in, in aggregate push the market o over time and towards expiry. Hey, this has been extremely helpful, John. I know we're going to have you back because I'm sure the comments are all going to say, more John, less Tom, <laughs> no, <they laughs> but, uh, <laughs> which we love. But uh, I, I can't thank you enough. Really glad we got connected and I'm sure it'll be more in the future. Thanks again, John. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. And we're back. So that was pretty amazing and, uh, and, and helpful to, I'm sure, a lot of you. If you have any additional questions, you can uh, reach out and uh, hit me on that front, and we can do them in the AMA sections moving forward, or we can have John back at some point. He's agreed to do that as needed, which is pretty exciting. Also want to thank Anyana Mariam Rajesh for including me in her article on Reuters. And finally, uh, Helen Kostler and Samritha Arun Salam for including me also in their article on Reuters. This is an indicator of the day I wanted to touch base on. By the way, I loved today's price action, okay? You had two things happen today. One was a failed bond auction, and that is supposedly, the rumor around the street is ICC, one of the Chinese banks that does the bidding in these auctions got hacked. So there was no bid from China today. Uh, that seems coincident with the imminent meeting uh, between Xi and Biden and some of the business leaders probably signaling like, hey, let's cooperate because here's what lack of cooperation looks like moving forward. And you saw a 10-year yield uh, 
bump up by 10 basis points. Uh, so I think that's probably a decent context to get them into in a cooperative move mood, which would be good for all parties, uh, all things considered. So, um, uh, but this, uh, and, and then the second thing is, of course, Powell saw the market go straight up after his last uh, <laughs> press conference when he said the risks were two-sided and he had to come out today and say, well, you're not exactly two-sided, kind of two-sided. I'm not sure how many sides there are, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to threaten you again because I get scared when financial conditions ease. I don't want in uh, inflation to reaccelerate. So that's what he did today. And it's beautiful because the timing couldn't be more perfect. You had so many people pessimistic and bearish. And this is actually a proxy for Cooper Standard today, by the way, which we're going to talk a lot about. Um, in that so many people were bearish last week, like record puts, record cash, record people, short bonds. And then what happened? You know, the 10 year Treasury rolled over 50 basis point drop uh, in yields. Uh, stocks went straight up for nine days. And no one believes it because they were all so pessimistic. So for the first four or five days, they're all saying, oh, this is a fake out. Let's double down on our shorts. Uh, let's, you know, uh, get further short uh, the long bond. Let's get further short equities. This is a fake out. And then it goes up another four days and they are forced back in. First, they're just covering their shorts. Then they're actually forced to buy and chase in the year end. And that's when you get these air pockets where you completely destroy those people. And that's exactly what happened today. And it, and it happened in a more pronounced way, even in Cooper Standard, um, which we're going to talk about in a second. You can tell by the way Cooper Standard trades that right now there's, there's limited institutional sponsorship because they all got flushed out uh, during the pandemic. All the institutions just sold in the hole. That's when we were buyers. And now it's starting to work its way up. But it's all these kind of weak hands that, uh, you know, you, you basically had... I'm going to pull up the chart here, a uh, 71% rally since October 25th in Cooper Standard. So in a matter of, uh, you know, 13 days, the thing is up 71% from 1126 to 1934. And, and what happens is this. So everyone got excited at $20 over the summer, and then you had the strike and the thing sold off. Everyone got flushed out. OK, and then they were so pessimistic about the strike and everything. So they didn't get in for earnings. So then what happened after earnings? Boom, it was up 43 percent the day of earnings. And um, so everyone thought, oh, well, this has just got to be a fake out. And then what happened in the last two days? It started pushing higher above the highs after uh, um, uh, the earnings thing and people are saying, oh, my God, I'm never going to get in. This thing's going to go to $100 without me. What the hell am I going to do? And this is all dumb money mindset, by the way. So what did they do? They chased up for the last few ticks. And I'm sure they got flushed today. And all these people up here that didn't believe it down here, that didn't believe it at five bucks last year, 550 when we originally put it out on the podcast, chased up here. They got flushed. Probably one more day of flushing would be really good. I don't know if we'll get it, but but one more just to get them all out. The ones that bought up at 19 again were probably the same ones who bought up at 20 over the summer that sold down at 11. So they'll sell it at 16 and they'll never be back in the stock again. Even when it gets to 30 and $40, they're done. They're toast because they, they did it on margin. And that's what a recovery looks like. And then that dumb money is going to start to be replaced with smart money and institutional money is going to start to come in. And you're going to see in coming quarters as Cooper Standard continues to generate cash flow positive results like they did this quarter, uh, generated four million dollars of cash. Uh, institutions are going to start to step back in and the longer the stock stays above 10, 15 dollars then spawn and then especially 20 you're going to start to see more and more institutions start to sponsor it. and these air pockets with dumb money are going to get less and less and less and then it's just going to be about earnings and fundamentals all this short-term emotional voting machine is going to re be replaced by long-term fundamental weighing machine uh and it's just going to press higher and higher and higher but it's just nice to see this is exactly the way it's supposed to be uh and um and the novices don't understand that. So, um, but that's how we all learn. The only way you can know this stuff. And as, as bad as it looked from Powell and the busted bond auction today, I mean, in the scheme of things, basically just maybe we'll fill this gap tomorrow if, uh, 
if, if we're lucky. Uh, and then I think we're going to press higher into year end. And, and this from Jeffrey Hirsch actually lays out the normal plan when you have uh, seven to nine day bullish streaks where the market goes straight up. What happens the next day after uh, seven, eight or nine days of straight up on the S&P 500? What do you do? You get this check back, then you get a, a rally. So you do what I talked about on Liz Clayman. I said, uh, we may get some consolidation right now. What, what happens after these moves straight up? You consolidate. So you pull back, you grind sideways for a little bit. Everyone's going to be looking for the move back down. That's never going to happen. And what happens? You're going to grind sideways to up into year end and probably up a lot further than most people expect into year end. I think Santa's going to bring a lot of gifts this year because no one's expecting a lot of gifts. But this is the model based on all of the data that Jeffrey Hirsch over at Stock Traders Almanac uh, and his father before then, Yale Hirsch, um, uh, have calculated since 1971 on average when you have seven to nine consecutive up days, what happens next? And the answer to what happens next is it keeps going higher at a slower rate of change after you shake out these last minute Nellies, nervous Nellies who get shaken out and then we can move up into year end without them. Um, so this chart right here, as much as people think that everything's overbought and we're gonna go back down, uh, you can see S&P 500 stocks above the 200 day moving average. We're just getting started. You know, there was a real route in September and October because uh, no one could tell where rates were going to peak. And like I said with Liz, uh, the new narrative that's going to permeate is peak yields. And in that context, those companies that have a little leverage on their balance sheet, which everyone had to presume will go bankrupt when rates don't stop going higher, now that rates have stopped going higher and are going to be in a range, analysts can quantify what the cost of capital is going to be and actually start to do discounted cash flows and realize that most of these stocks down 60, 70, 80 percent have dramatically overshot. And that's when you're going to start to see broader participation with more of these stocks moving above their 200 day moving average, increased breadth. And that's going to be the healthy sign that this rally is durable as we work to new highs in coming months. Uh, new all-time highs in coming months is our view. So, uh, and we're also, speaking of Jeff Hirsch, entering the best six months of the year. We're just getting started. For those of you thinking about, oh, should I put money to work? Shouldn't I put money to work, et cetera? Uh, this is the time to put money to work because the odds favor it from the end of October through May are the strongest six months of the year. And um, the beauty is X those seven magnificent seven most of the stocks are still dramatically on sale. So the ability to put money in the best six months of the year at the best prices that have been served up in the last two months is an advantageous time to take advantage. So um, put that away. Here's the uh, uh, Slumer report from RBC Wealth Management. I wanna, you know, my buddy knows who he is. Uh, thank you for sending that over. Here's the S&P 500. As you can see, the weekly momentum is now in our favor, despite the one day check back, which again is right in line with expectations. A little grind here for the next week. Consolidation as we anticipated on Fox Business and then push higher. And for the shorts, it's going to be the pain. The beatings will continue until morale improves. That is going to be the theme for shorts over the next few months. The beatings will continue until morale improves. And uh, we're gonna work right through this short-term consolidation and we're gonna push higher in our view. Statistically uh, speaking, uh, odds are in our favor. And that's all we ever play is probability weighted decisions. Then you look at the 10 year yield, uh, you have the weekly completely rolling over momentum. So yes, we got a counter trend rally now uh, today on uh, um, a hacked Chinese bank. Uh, and uh, I mean, who the hell's hacking them now? I mean, if, if, if they're the, usually the ones, you know, uh, the Russians aren't hacking them, we hope. Uh, anyway, so uh, that's funny. Nonetheless, leaving that aside, uh, here we go, the 10 year yield momentum that's rolling over, that's critical to our thesis. By the way, very excited for Alibaba to report next Thursday, November 16th. So we're looking forward to that. We'll have a lot to talk about, I think, on the call. Uh, yeah, if they report in the morning, we should be able to talk about it in the afternoon. 
10 year yield short term, you can see this is absolutely collapsed. Um, even WTI crude, remember the article two weeks ago, what a girl wants, what a girl needs, whatever, what did everyone want up here? Oil and energy stocks. What did they need? All the things that have gone up in the last week, uh, the biggest, some of the biggest performers last week were utilities, everything interest rate sensitive. REITs were a huge outperformer. Utilities were a huge outperformer. Financials were a huge outperformer. Uh, and, and they all wanted energy at the top. And those stocks are all down 20% now. And some of them maybe start to get interesting, but not yet in our view. So uh, incentives are starting on the dealership side. Here's from the car dealership guy. Uh, all of these uh, D, uh, um, uh, OEMs are now offering 0% financing for, for their models. And here's about two dozen. And what I said with this is that with financing at the new car manufacturers now between zero and 2.9%, even if the stickers are, you know, 40, 50% higher than a used car with used car financing at nine to 11%, your, your monthly payment is gonna be cheaper buying a new car, and that's exactly gonna benefit the OEMs, which more importantly is going to, because we don't, you know, we're, we don't own OEMs, we own the suppliers, and all we care about is the volume. We, we're not interested in the OEMs margins, we're interested in the, the volumes for Cooper Standard supplying the sealing systems, fuel and brake delivery systems, um, uh, and cooling systems, et cetera. Uh, and this is the climate that we've say, been saying was going to come, just like in May of last year when we were saying semiconductors are going to come in. No one believed it because there was a shortage. All of a sudden, the whole back half semiconductors started flowing in uh, and they got, got the parts in. And that's not even in the conversation now. Now the incentives are coming in. The volumes are going to go through the roof. And uh, we're excited about that. Here's from Ryan Dietrich. Credit card debt hit another all-time high. Uh, and delinquencies are starting to move higher, but credit card debt as a percentage of disposable income is still below pre-COVID levels and well below the 2000s levels. So bottom line, incomes have been increasing as well. And you can see here that uh, as we've discussed historically, the debt service as a percentage of disposable income is at multi, multi, multi decades, going back to the 60s lows. So while you see all the headlines, $1 trillion of credit card debt, uh, the servicing as a percentage of income and as a percentage of GDP and as a percentage of adjusted numbers is uh, near historic lows. The savings, excess savings are still high and the consumer is still in good shape. And the name of the game is you can never bet against the U.S. consumer when they have jobs and we still have record uh, low unemployment. This was from about a week ago showing just how flushed out uh, investor positioning is in financial stocks. These are the most hated right now. I think this is going to be a huge narrative in the next 12 months. We're going to see financials get bid in a major way, along with small caps, by the way. Uh, there was some data I didn't get to write down today, but effectively, you know, you can, you know, S&P, IWM to S&P is basically the lowest it's been since the pandemic lows and then uh, the 2000 two lows. And if anyone remembers, and it's very similar to emerging markets, um, from 2002 to 2007, the best performing things you could have been in were small caps and emerging markets and China. And we're set up at exactly the same extremes right now as we were back then. So when you're talking about secular multi-year trends, you're never going to pin it to the day or the week or the month. But if you can get in the ballpark in that six to 12 month range, where you're building positions right before the thing takes off. In that case, the emerging market index was up 450% in the next few years. Uh, small caps were up in this in a similar neighborhood and, um, and you wanna be positioned for both and financials are gonna play a major role in that, particularly when these mark to markets get solved with the 10 year yield coming off the boil and staying off the boil, which we're already starting to see. Here is the insider transactions ratio. Uh, insider buying in their stock when it gets down to these levels is bullish. We're there right now. Uh, central banks now cutting rates at the fastest pace since August of 2020. Uh, so if you were buying equities ahead of that, you did extremely well. Uh, and uh, same thing with early 2009 at the March lows. 
uh, and, and over and over and over. And then 2011 and 12 after the European debt crisis. So similar thing is happening right now. And, um, and that's going to be a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, Jason Gopeford says the Hang Seng is on track for its fourth straight negative year. That's never happened before since 1964. It has done one three-year losing streak ending in 2002. Again, pointing back to 2002, by the way, these stretched extremes. Here are its return over the following five years, plus 35%, plus 13%, plus 5%, plus 34%, plus 39%. So that's the index which means the good quality companies within that index were up 50 to 100% a year, compounded for four or five years. And that's why you saw many, many multi-baggers and we're gonna see many, many multi-baggers prospectively. Um, so that's that. And then uh, Freshippo keeps competitive edge with price cuts. For those of you who don't remember, uh, we one of the six parts uh, of Alibaba is Freshippo, which we think is the next Costco of China and they've got scale and they've got size and they get zero credit in the price of the stock. They're gonna be a separate IPO. And uh, what are they doing? They are crushing their competition with price cuts because they can afford to do so. So they're gonna just steal share uh, and, and destroy the smaller players and then IPO and take the whole market and will own that, So which is exciting. Same with Ant Financial. They received the Chinese government nod to roll out AI services. So the government is now cooperating with them versus uh, acting against them. And then their logistics arm, a, a third part that you own as an owner of Alibaba, is the uh, logistics arm uh, Kainau, which will enhance its overseas president with proposed buyout of local rival called Best. Um, so, so they're expanding. And speaking of expansion, I thought the most exciting headline I saw this week was this aliexpress becomes europe's biggest e-commerce site so they overtook amazon in europe uh in the past week so this is just mind-boggling because when you think about it you don't even give credit for the international business when you're thinking about alibaba and they're just growing like a weed um, and as Americans, you don't really see it, although more and more people are using Alibaba, AliExpress in the US. Um, uh, but, but that just goes to show you the embedded value as the dollar weakens and comes off the boil and flows go back into emerging markets. And you get a couple of these catalysts with positive diplomatic things, not because they love each other, but because they need each other. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a, uh, you know, it's like, it's like a, you know, angry married couple that stays together, uh, you know, because they can't afford to live on their own or something. I think that's the I think that's a perfect analogy for uh, for uh, for China and the United States, you know, on their own, they would uh, they would definitely both be at a disadvantage. So even though they kind of don't like each other, they they should choose to cooperate and, and they both wind up better off for it. Um, Asian uh, foreign investors trickle back into Asian equities on hope of Fed rate cycle peak, as well as dollar coming off the boil. Uh, Chinese stocks start recovery when no one is watching. This is from Zero Hedge of all places. Uh, what's more, the input prices from the PMI has been turning up strongly, suggesting increased economic activity is creating price pressure catalyzed by an improvement in economic activity. And also you're seeing uh, less tight standards Increased loan, uh, loan growth should soon start to pick up once you get the expansion in the credit cycle. It's off to the races. So we're seeing signs of both of those things. And that's what you've seen before every major rally in China equities is these two things turn up and they've been turning up for months now. So very excited to see that. Now, moving on to Disney. Uh, Disney was up big uh, most of the day. I think it closed up meaningfully, even though the market was weak. Um, uh, they basically increased their cutting. They're going to cut seven and a half billion dollars of cost. They increased their subs by seven million. We'll go into more details on that, but that was exciting to see. That's a big position for us. And then uh, Wall Street veteran sees once in a generation buying opportunity in unloved areas of global stocks. So he's taking a look at uh, this is a guy from Bernstein saying, um, you know, the Magnificent Seven are more than twice the valuations of uh, either the equal weight S&P, which would include kind of small caps getting heavier weights, small and mid caps, which have dramatically lower multiples than 
the large cap uh, or cap weighted index of the S&P 500. And then the real bargains are uh, ex-US international stocks, small and mid cap, uh, Europe, et cetera, we agree, but you can see it quantitatively in that data. I don't know why this keeps logging me out. Uh, now this one I love because this was kind of what, this was the theme of the last seven, eight weeks when we kept saying, treasuries are gonna turn. Look how short these people are. Look, you know, they follow the commercials. The commercials are getting long. The large speculators and hedge funds are record short. They haven't been this short since the low in late October before you had a monster rally in treasuries. Well, sure enough, the turn kicked in. Let's see if I can actually log in so we can look at some of these charts. I don't know why it always does that. Um, okay, well, anyway, the article's title is, here we go, Info. Okay, so the R uh, oops. If it automatically populates, we'll get in. If not, I don't remember all my passcodes. Let's see. Oh, all right. So basically what it's showing is what you guys knew listening to the podcast for a handful of weeks before we finally got the turn. And that is you had hedge funds boosted record treasury shorts at the exact wrong time. And then you can see what we've been saying, they haven't been this short since the end of 2018, right before treasuries rallied massively for the next year. And that's exactly what we're starting to see the early stages of. And it's not perfect, maybe it's this line here, maybe we have a little more, or maybe we're finally there and it just continues to go up like we saw in 2018. But this is an extreme. And when everyone gets to one side of the boat, you know what we do. When everyone's zigging, we zag. And uh, even if we have to wait a little while for, for everyone to come on around to our side, they invariably do. And that's when you make the extreme moves. When everyone's selling in the hole, we're taking the other side. Uh, Citigroup considers deep job cuts for CEO Jane Frazier's overhaul called Project Bora Bora. I think at this point, it might not be a bad idea to send Jane Frazier to Bora Bora and uh, get someone in there that can actually deliver. She's had more than enough time to deliver. Uh, but um, I, I, the good news is it seems like she is feeling the urgency and the pressure and she's finally taking action. The bad news is uh, she might not be the person to get it done, but I hope to be proven wrong because we own the stock, uh, but we're gonna find out. I think, you know, it's gonna go with all the financials. It's the cheapest, which is why it's been a recent ad. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm not sure that she's the jockey. And I usually don't bet on a stock without a great jockey, but in this case, it's just so cheap that um, either she'll you know, get religion or they'll bring in someone quickly who, who does and, uh, and it'll get done because there's just an enormous amount of embedded value. You know, they could work 24 hours a day to destroy the business and then just, they just haven't been successful. Uh, now, God forbid you get anyone in there with talent and uh, you could have some real massive value realization in a, in a very short period of time. And that's what we're counting on. Hopefully it's from Jane, but uh, we're open to someone else as well. Uh, Disney is the number one cruise line for families. Travelers say, you know, it's just like it's just like Baba. You know, there are all these pieces that are assigned zero value for that have a tremendous amount of value. You know, when you think about Disney in the last few months, when we were, you know, kind of talking about it a lot on the podcast and saying, look, this is the best parks franchise, this is the best content content library. They're going to figure it out. Um, uh, and, um, and then you, you know, you don't even account for some of the other parts of the experiences that are doing extremely well and all the other ways that they can monetize their library, their content library, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, John pointed to some of the reasons why people think the stock was down and, and, and that type of thing. Uh, there are a lot of factors, you know, it was basically cleaning up years of mess all at once. And now... What I love about the theme of the call last night, and we'll get into, is the fact that they're now moving from fixing the problems back to building the business. And uh, it's kind of a, a di distinction between a scarcity mindset of trying to conserve, which never works, to a growth and abundance mindset and a creative mindset of building and growing and expanding. And they're, and they're just at that inflection 
And that's the time you want to own these great franchises that have huge durable moats and, uh, and take advantage. So earnings results are hopping, stock market and sentiment results. You can see this chart from Yardeni. Um, you know, consensus forecasts of, at about four, uh, 246 for next year for the S&P, 276 for the year after. Uh, Yardeni is a little higher. We happen to agree with Yardeni um, and so forth. So uh, my notes ahead of the segment with Liz, a couple things we didn't get to cover due to time constraints. Number one, was kind of what are the conditions for things being positive one obviously uh positioning was offsides everyone was short equities long cash short long bonds uh consensus was too negative on earnings we talked about that for many weeks before earnings started we said you know estimates were negative 30 basis points negative 40 basis points we said that they had been too pessimistic by 300 basis points we're going to finish this earnings season plus 3%, we're now plus 3.7%. So even I wasn't optimistic enough, if you can believe that. <laughs> um, inflation's obviously in a better spot. We are getting some of the benefits of the lagged effect. We'll see that in the employment numbers this week we'll talk about later. 10-year uh, coming off the boil, dollar coming off the boil. Uh, estimates for earnings growth next year, plus 12%. And if you look at multiples, that would be the bear's argument. They're so skewed by the Magnificent Seven. If you back those out, the average forward multiple is less than 15 times, which creates a tremendous opportunity with 12% earnings growth uh, to be able to buy some quality companies at 10 to 15 times, which is the vast majority of the market outside Magnificent Seven, creates tremendous opportunities prospectively. Um, but this is the key thing that you want to keep in mind. As the yields now stay stable and stop going up every single day as they did for eight weeks and uh, maybe even come down a little bit even more uh, maybe down to the 425 450 range versus 450 475 range or 450 to 5 range uh, what's going to happen is that narrative is going to permeate that rates have peaked and that's when all of these companies with any any leverage on their balance sheet uh, and their equities have been decimated, start to get rip-roaring rallies and short covering, and, and you're going to see that in coming months. Um, so, And then, as we discussed, the market will consolidate the recent gains and then press higher into year-end, so we're start, starting to see that consolidation now. Um, we covered VF Corp, and I also wanted to cover Cooper Standard. We didn't have time for that, but we're going to cover that now. Uh, this was just more, uh, we covered VF Corp and PayPal last week. If you didn't listen to last week's call and you want detail, uh, more granular detail on VF Corp, you can click on this link and read that article or listen to last week's podcast. All of our podcasts are found here under um, categories on hedgefundtips.com. Click on Videocast Weekly Recap and then click on Terms. This is all opinion, not advice. We don't know your financial situation. We deal exclusively with accredited investors and qualified institutions um, talk to your financial advisor. So um, so this is when we were talking to Charles on October 16th, the beginning of earnings season. We said people are too pessimistic about earnings. And, uh, and sure enough, that's what how what played out with earnings. You've seen the 10 year yield absolutely collapse since that. We said we, we thought the peak in earning peak in yields was in uh, that proved to be accurate. And that's what's happened since absolutely rolled over and then same thing with the US dollar uh, so there we are and then I also was laughing about the overshoot on the GLP ones and this week uh, the CEO of Mondelez was on talking about uh, you know he comes from the pharmaceutical industry so he's been talking with a lot of the executives and and he's like they can't even understand what all the hype is all, all about this is going to be like Best case scenario, if everything goes perfect, it'll be 7 to 14% of the U.S. population using one of these drugs uh, by 2030 to 2035. And, the, and how he calculated it is that even with maximum adoption, and that's excluding the possibility of all the side effects, which uh, right now are anecdotal, we'll see if they're uh, become more prevalent, uh, whether that's... Um, pancreatitis, whether that is uh, involuntary bowel movements, whether that is um, um, in, in mice, there were, uh, they have to put a warning uh, for, I think it's thyroid cancer. 
Uh, it's not yet proven out in humans because there's not enough time on the drug yet to prove it out. Um, uh, oh, and the greatest irony of this drug is that apparently you lose a lot of muscle when you use it. So the first thing they advise you to do if you're going to use this drug is to go to the gym. <laughs> and the irony is <laughs> if you wanted to go to the gym, you wouldn't need the drug in the first place for most people. Now, <laughs> that's not to say there's not a meaningful segment of the population like bariatric surgery that this is going to change their life and it's going to be very, very useful for uh, and there's no other alternative. Um, and, you know, that, that bariatric surgery helped a lot of people, too. Uh, also had side effects. It also wasn't for everyone. But um, I, I just think it's kind of funny. It's like, OK, so either I go to the gym and I get healthy on my own and it costs me, you know, 100 bucks a month at Equinox or whatever it is, or 10 bucks a month at um, Planet Fitness or wh whatever these gyms cost. Or uh, I pay you 1400 bucks a month to stab myself once a week with this drug to lose weight, but then I still have to go to the gym or I lose all my muscle. Uh, and by the way, if I stop stabbing myself and I stop paying you 1400 bucks a month, I gain all the weight back. Uh, so it doesn't sound like a great deal, but I think everyone's got to get on it first and realize that you know, what it is. Because when there's a craze, it's like fear of loss. When everyone sees their neighbors losing weight, et cetera, et cetera, they do that. But at the end of the day, the problem is, is when they get off, they're going to think they can keep it off. Then they gain it all back. And then they're back to where they were, maybe with interest. Uh, and the difference is they've dropped $6,000 over four months to, you know, do that thought experiment. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's, uh, that's meaningful. And, um, uh, anyway, so I hope it helps the people who have no options and probably another percentage or two of, of the population that doesn't. But even in the best case scenario, the hype and frenzy uh, and the analysts on TV saying le legitimately, I quote you, if, if McDonald's switches to lettuce and carrots at the drive through maybe they can stay in business. I that was literally quoted on a major financial network during the mania a couple weeks ago around this. Um, you can't make it up. So Zweig breath thrust. This was triggered. This is a technical indicator that was triggered last Friday. And there have only been 17 previous instances. You can read what this, how it's all calculated and everything else. <clears throat> but it just basically means a broad swath of the market goes up massively in a short period of time after being flushed out. And when that happens, and it meets these specific me metrics in the calculation, the average return over the next 12 months is 23.3%. It's happened 17 times since World War II. It just happened on Friday. Now, uh, Jay Capel over at Sentiment Trader added some color on this. He said, when you get two signals within 18 months, which we've just had, we had, I think, one in March and one now, your average return goes from 23.3 up to 26.8. Does that guarantee? No, some, some years it was up 44%, some years it was up only 15%, uh, but it was actually 100% positivity rate, so that's pretty damn good. Uh, all right, moving on to Cooper Standard. Um, Cooper Standard continues to buy, okay, continues to climb on above average daily volume. So today it actually declined on uh, not very high volume, which um, was kind of interesting and just shows kind of the type of people are, who are in the stock. And it reminds me of that quite, uh, that ask me anything question a couple of weeks ago of why we didn't sell at $20 or something like that. And it was just completely clear that no matter how much you explain about the business, um, people are still focused on price and they don't get it. And that's fine because it just takes a while of understanding things until you get it. But there's still a lot of people in the stock that are focused on price and don't understand the operating leverage in this business as the cycle returns and volumes return and, and what can happen. So, you know, there'll be the people that get in at 19, sell out at 16, watch it go to 30. Maybe they'll have courage to buy it up at 30, comes down to 20 before it goes up to 40, 50, 60, 70 and beyond in our view. Um, so here are the instances when we laid it out in May, uh, June, on, well, we laid it out in the podcast in May of 2022. Uh, when it was in the fives and threes actually got down to the threes after we we started um bought some up in the sixes bought some down basis was 550 and then we've we've since added 
but the um but that was the first time uh i think it was six dollars on that day and then uh, we followed up uh at the end of the year in december with kelly o'grady and it was at i think 750 that day then we followed up with uh um shauna smith over at yahoo this summer and i think it was at like 15 or 16 or something like that and so on and so forth so um you know here's some more incentives i was watching america's got talent with my daughter this weekend and this ad came up so i took a picture on my phone uh so and then here's some of the original thesis so you have a leader in ceiling solutions around the windows doors you know you can see here uh and then uh fluid handling systems etc uh, here are some of the clients. They also have Tesla. They just can't use their trademark on their pitch deck. As you can see, uh, our thesis is predicated exclusively on internal combustion vehicles, which has the lowest number of parts and the lowest margins. But as they do more and more volume in EVs and in hybrids, it's more parts and it's more margin per car, which is why we think that just getting back to 85% of 2017 volumes, we can earn and because they have a lower share count, we can earn the same amount that that the company earned in 2017, which was $7.21 a share. Uh, and that's when the stock was trading at $146 because it had a 20 times multiple. But even if you have uh, not a peak multiple, you have a trough multiple of 10 times, you know, we believe it's a $70 plus and, uh, and it's all uh, moving in that direction. So these are the uh, IHS volume productions. It's, it's expected to, uh, volumes are expected to return to 2017 levels by 2024, 2025. In 2017, they did um, 452 million of EBITDA, uh, 135 million net income, $7.20 a share in earnings. And here's what Cooper could achieve in 2024, 2025 industry volumes, meet expectations and return to near 2017 levels, and I think they only have to return to 85% of 2017 levels to do this. 3.3 billion in revenues because they sold the anti-vibration business, 412 million in adjusted EBITDA, 123 million in net income, and now they've only got 17 million shares because management respects equity, a little over 17 million shares, uh, which we own a nice amount. Uh, they, they can earn 719 a share at the 10 times multiple. That's a $71 stock at the 20 times multiple. It's $146 stock. So you cut both in half and you're still getting a multi bagger five to 10 X. Uh, and uh, but you say, you know, EPS will be affected by increased interest expense. That is correct. Interest expense in 2017 was 42 million, but taxes were also 74. While the interest expense in 2024 or 2025 will be 100 million, assuming they don't refinance at lower rates in the coming year. If you look at the dot plot, uh, Fed's expecting 50 basis points of cuts the back half of next year. Um, they have 130 million in deferred tax assets. They will just be moving into profitability and will be able to use a significant portion of that asset to dramatically reduce their cash, ta cash tax obligation. In effect, it's possible that EPS in 2024 or 2025 could be a tick higher than 2017 on the same or slightly lower volume. The key will be what multiple is assigned, a peak multiple of 20 times, or a trough multiple of 10 times. And as I've said numerous times on our podcast video cast, there are three reasons why I bought ownership in the company. Number one, management respects the equity they've bought and uh, they brought down share count. They brought the share count down over the years. Number two, management compensation is tied to return on invested capital. Uh, and they've committed to uh, re restoration of double digit return on invested capital. And three, operating leverage in this business is unparalleled coming out of industry troughs. This trade was modeled after the trade that um, Charlie Munger did in the 2001 to 2003 recession when he bought Tenneco. It was down from like $16 to $1, everyone $1 and change. Everyone was worried about um, Everyone was worried about uh, uh, bankruptcy and refinancing risk, just like they were with Cooper Standard last year before they got the refinancing done. The stock went from you know buck back to fifteen. Charlie sold out. Uh, he made, I think he made, he said he made ten million, turned into eighty million. Then he gave the eighty million to Li Lu to invest in China. Remember, China from two thousand two to two thousand seven went straight up four hundred percent. Well, that eighty became five hundred. 
Uh, so that was pretty good return on the trade. And by the way, I think we're going to have the exact same situation coming out of this trade with China. History doesn't r repeat, but it does rhyme. I think this is going to parlay right into the same time the China trade is working in a major way. When it comes, it comes all at once. And um, uh, so long story short, Charlie sold it at uh, 16. It, it, it eventually went on to 35. Uh, which he shoots, he kicks himself for, but you know, world's smallest violin, right? All right, past performance is no guarantee of future results. See terms, what's new? Okay, so they sales grew 12% year on year, gross profit uh, grew 176.3% year on year uh, to 106.5 million. Uh, net income improved by 44 million and adjusted EBITDA was at uh, 79.1 million or 10.7% of sales. That increased by 58.8. So that, that's really exciting to see. I think when you look at the improvement year on year, the most important number to me, and they also took guidance up, by the way, they increased their guidance. Uh, the range on the top line, they increased the uh, total gu guidance on adjusted EBITDA. And the most important thing that I like to see is the fact that they uh, generated free cash flow in, in the quarter of $4 million and their in uh, liquidity actually moved up. What was also a, si a signal of confidence in my view is they drew down, uh, they've got $259 million dollars of liquidity. They actually drew down 100 million during the strike just as a precaution against their uh, uh, ABL asset uh, backed loan. And they said on the conference call that they paid that back already because they wouldn't be needing it. So that is uh, very exciting to see that they've got enough cash. They now have free cash flow. They didn't, they didn't need it. They did it as a precaution and they already paid it back. So uh, pretty exciting on that front. Um, and then the last slide is also pretty important here in terms of the amount of costs that they've taken out of the business, 479 million. And, uh, and their um, revenue growth versus industry growth. So they're expected to grow revenues at 8% uh, compound annual growth rate. And that implies that 3.15% billion dollar top line in revenue by 2025 and 3.4 billion in 2026 this puts us right in line with our original thesis from last year which is um 3.3 billion in revenues 412 million of adjusted ebitda 123 million in net income uh 719 a share in earnings and then peaker trough multiple 10 times is a 70 dollars stock 20 times is 140 dollars and uh and that's that. So here are some highlights from the earnings call. Uh, so they delivered 14 million in savings through lean addition and cost savings. Uh, they got new contracts for $91 million in annualized sales. Uh, new business awards for e pla e EV platforms of 34 million. They've, oh, this is very important. We talked about last time. They finished the vast majority of their negotiations are now complete. Uh, resulting in significantly enhanced commercial agreements that will provide for inflation recovery as well as sustainable pricing going forward. Approximately 75% of the recoveries and price adjustments achieved will carry forward into 2024 and beyond. We anticipate concluding the few remaining customer negotiations before the end of the year. So they got basically everything done before the strike, which was brilliant on, on behalf of management. I'm very excited about their ability to execute. Um, also, they're talking about new technologies they have, um, which are providing growth opportunities through increased content per vehicle and margin enhancement. We've already launched and sold many unique product innovations. Our pipeline of new technologies soon to be in the market holds great promise. Their e-coflow technology eliminates independent valves and pumps, combining functionality in a single unit. Uh, it's expected to lower overall cost of fluid management systems for the OEM customer, but will provide increased content and margin for Cooper standard. Very exciting. So these are just additional improvements that are not baked into our model that they're doing. The other thing that they're doing, which I think could be a, a monster when you think about it, is they're adding a wide variety of color options that can enhance overall vehicle aesthetics. 
we anticipate our full thermoplastic dynamic seal will be formally available for new business quotes early next year. So if you think about all the ceiling around your car, it's always been black. Imagine if you could get the same color to match the paint of your car. I think a lot of people will like that. Um, and it's just uh, obviously not going to be the same price as the black one. <laughs> it's going to be more money, uh, more money for the owners. And uh, and that's a good thing. So uh, they also have this. They're commercializing live line technologies, their proprietary AI based advanced process control system. They've developed LiveLine as a means of improving efficiency and reducing scrap on their own extrusion lines. Over the past few years, we've developed the technology on 20 lines in four countries, and the realized savings have been and continue to be significant. Based on that initial internal success with relatively low cost and efficient scalability, we believe the technology has potential to benefit many manufacturing companies within a wide range of industries, making advanced process control systems more affordable and uh, accessible. We began marketing the technology through a wholly owned AI technology startup subsidiary called LiveLine Technologies. Maybe we'll get an AI multiple on the stock of 100 times, which would be unbelievable, uh, and have just received our first commercial order for a large fiber optic manufacturer. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, and again, not in our model. These are just free whipped cream. We're still in the early stages of marketing this technology, but we believe this first commercial contract provides an important validation of the business model and the opportunity ahead. Uh, okay, so, uh, okay, restore our margins and returns on invested capital to double digit levels. Very few managers properly talk about return on invested capital. These guys get it. Based on our strong performance, uh, performance in the third quarter, continuing results from our enhanced commercial agreements and expected higher production post the recent strikes. We have adjusted our guidance to reflect an improved outlook for the full year. We raised the range for expected full year adjusted EBITDA. We are, we are confident we'll finish the year strong, achieve next year and beyond, excited what we can achieve next year and beyond as production volumes continue to rebound to pre-pandemic levels. We believe we'll enhance content per vehicle and variable contribution margins going forward. So that is the most exciting news of the week in our view. And then here are a bunch of other companies we've discussed in recent weeks and months on the podcast. Uh, they're just crushing earnings across the board, whether it's Generac, PayPal we covered last week, Intel's been a monster, no one wanted it at 25, yesterday it was at 39, uh, and that one's taken off in just a few months. 3M had good earnings and uh, you know they're, they're, every time, they're starting to work their way higher. We feel good about that one. Clorox, Stanley Black & Decker, same thing. Baxter, you know, Amazon, uh, VF Corp we talked about. Vornado, the, the numbers look bad. Earnings were fine. This is just going to trade with rates now moving forward. We got the best quality properties, et cetera. So uh, Generac, let's see, how are we on time? Well, we're at a buck. So we, we're going to uh, just cover a quick few quick highlights here in Disney. You can go back and read these. We've got a lot of Ask Me Anything questions. It's kind of like catching up, even though we did the podcast early last week. Uh, I think there's a lot of pent up demand for these Ask Me Anything questions, and we're going to take it, uh, uh, deliver that value. So, okay. Cash flow from operations for Generac was $140 million during the third quarter compared to negative 56 million in the prior year. Um, Free cash flow was 117 million compared to negative 73 million. So, and they repurchased 875 million, 870,000, 5,850 shares of common stock for 100 million. Uh, this is not, this is not the action that management takes when they don't have confidence about the future of the business. Uh, and what that basically means to us, as owners of the business, is that we just got a greater share of the Generac pie prospectively with no new money out of pocket. So um, that's huge. And, and that's what cash gener buying cash generative companies does over time. Remember, the cash flows trend up, the price oscillates massively around those cash flows. We buy in the trough. Sometimes we get the exact perfect trough to the day. Sometimes we get it within months, it doesn't really matter. As long as the cash flows are trending properly and it's temporary, not permanent impairments, and then you just wait and play the time arbitrage game and they're making our life even easier by giving us a bigger slice of the pie when you get full recovery. And they show here 
gosh, I wish I could, maybe we'll spend some more time on it next week, that this is very normal. Every cycle, they check back for a year or two. Uh, you know, we've already, that's already priced in the stock. And then they, they take their next cycle up. So they have massive growth. They check back. They have massive growth. They check back. They massive growth. They check back. And it's just a normal cyclical business. Now, um, so basically they're talking about, um, you know, they've worked the inventories down, which was our thesis, and they're going to return to margin expansion and robust free cash flow generation. This is interesting. Um, 15%. Okay, just getting better. Okay, I love this story. Michigan, okay. Uh, power outages are on the rise. They're lasting longer. There's another outage in Michigan today. Michigan has just been hammered by outages. That's the one of the reasons why it's a really good market for us penetration wise. I mean, penetration rates in Michigan are over are over 15%, which is 15% of all single family homes over $150,000 in value have a home standby generation install, which is when you think about that for a second, to put it in context, I think it tells you where the penetration rate can go, right? I mean, the penetration rate nationally is 5.75%. And we are in states like Michigan where it's at 15%. So every 1% of penetration rate is $3 billion market opportunity. When you start to add that up, the numbers get really big really fast and we're at 75% market share. So that is huge, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, if you talk about 10 more points, $30 billion, uh, plus they're going to have all the add-on business with the uh, solar and the batteries and everything else, uh, this thing's just getting started. And we were able to buy it when it was marked down 80%, even though the cash flows trend up over time with some temporary impairments. This is a good quality business and they own their space, both on a brand-wise and delivery-wise and everything else. And here's the field inventory, which was why the stock got sold off, how they've worked that down. And it's now, it was at two times normal, and now it's at 1.2 times normal, and it's getting back back to normal, which means uh, you're going to start some re see massive reacceleration in the business, and, and we're excited about that. Intel, uh, look... We can go on and on about this one, but all you need to know is they generated almost $6 billion in cash from operations uh, last quarter. And that's the name of the game with all these and why they have a margin of safety is because they're cash flow generative. As far as Disney, some of the highlights, revenues actually grew. They increased their subs by $7 million. They're going to cut costs another $2, $2 billion more than they thought they could. And they're out of uh, conservation scarcity mode of fixing. They're back into expansion and growing the business. Um, as you can see here, they generated free cash flow of $3.4 billion in the quarter. That was up from $1.3 billion the previous year. Uh, free cash flow, it, it, both uh, year to date and for the quarter, are up well more than 100%. Uh, earnings per share uh, on the quarter is up over 100%. Um, revenues were up 5%, up 7% year to date. So that's all good. Subs are up. So everything is moving in the right direction. There's a lot to cover here, but we just, otherwise this is going to be like a four hour call by the time we get through it. So, you know, it's interesting. I was going to do like 10 companies today, but just not enough time. So you can read through this. You can see the ESPN plan, but the bottom line is the stock's going up and we own it. And that's what we want to see. Uh, this, I didn't like the uh, AAII sentiment survey, the bullish percent. So on the market going straight up the last week, the retail investor got excited. The bullishness went to 42%. A little bit of a red flag. It's probably why, also why we got a big check back today. Maybe we get a day follow through of weakness. Um, uh, but it's, you know, there have been levels where it's even gets more extreme. So it's not a signal. It's just something that raise your eyebrow and pay attention to. But then when you look at the fear and greed, it was only at 40. So there's a long way to go before people are just uh, over their skis. And then the National Association of Active Investment Managers, that got down as low as 29%. So all these institutional managers sold in the hole. And then this week they followed up to 61, but that's nowhere near. By the end of the year, I think we're going to see 100 print because they're going to have to chase up into year end. They missed the rally off of uh, October of last year. They missed the rally off of March this year. And it looks like they're missing the rally off of October, which would be pretty exciting. Um, uh, 
two of you reached out uh, in the last two days actually about reopening. Uh, after being highly exclusive since 2019 and closed to new investors prior to that, our business has expanded to serve an additional tier of clients. What that means is uh, our minimum used to be 5 million. Uh, we outgrew that exemption. So now we, we've uh, uh, been able to, for the last few months, accept uh, accounts as low as 1 million. And uh, uh, the, the response we received uh, blew the doors off, okay? So we're very excited about that. But as you know, pretty much we try to do it every quarter. We open it up and then we let, let people in, which we were successful. We were able to get all that capital deployed in Q3. So now we're opening up for Q4. And um, usually, depending, we'll get everyone in, we'll get everyone deployed. But even if you can't get in right away, it's usually maximum a 60 days waiting period. Uh, and then we'll be able to do it. So uh, if you missed our opening in early Q3, we're opening for Q4 this week. So for details and see if you qualify, just go here. If you're listening to this, you can find that form on hedgefundtips.com. Just click on the money management and we'll see if that's a fit. Uh, financials earnings top 30 weights uh, in the last 60 days were actually revised down 2.7% and 4.35%. And that a lot of that's reflected in the price. It's kind of interesting to see. Uh, and I think this is going to be a less important fact when uh, it's clear that interest rates have peaked and people are less worried about the mark to markets. And the better the mark to markets do, the more credit these banks can start to re-extend. Uh, and that's going to be key prospectively. But I think a lot of this is already priced into these stocks. Healthcare. Uh, down for next year, 1.44% for 2023. doesn't really matter anymore. Negative 2.71%. Uh, that's probably skewed by a couple of the bigger stocks here. It looks like McKesson, which is a, a, a benefits provider, uh, which makes sense. Um, and Regeneron had, uh, oh, ELV, I don't even know what that one is. That's a big drop, actually. That that might be the a big part of the weighting. I'm thinking that ticker is wrong. I'll have to check that out. Um, with George and Lily. Big drop. That can't uh, I'm gonna have to double check his numbers. But that looks like a big drop in Lily, which makes no sense. Um, all right, we'll have to double check these. And then UNH is a healthcare provider. So, okay. Um, now, uh, the data that we saw today was that initial jobless claims were higher than expected, 217 versus 215. This is good. You wanna see some of this weak stuff between now and December, because if we can keep the Fed out of the way, through year end, then it's as much as it's already kind of priced into the market that they're done, it will be nailed into the coffin that they're done. And that's what we need for um, things to settle down and some of these other 93% of the stock market to start galloping again, uh, continuing claims. And this is the kind of stuff that you wanna see uh, counterintuitively uh, in order for that to happen. Now, on to the ask me anything question. So for those of you who don't like asking me anything questions, thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. For those of you who get a lot of value, here we go. This is overtime. Uh, and uh, there you go. All right, Tila Tap asks, got a few questions. Could you explain why emerging market stocks get bid when the dollar weakens? Have you ever seen a time when the dollar weakens but emerging market stays low? Looking at the DXY and EM chart, looks to be a waiting game. And given that the Fed... The latest dot plot projections have said that rates will drop over the year. Surely EM stocks are an obvious buy question mark. Thank you for your wisdom. Uh, yeah, so what I did here is I actually did a long-term chart for UT, LATAP, so that you could see the correlation. And nothing's perfect, but uh, these are the conditions that you want to see. And basically, uh, this red and black here is the Emerging Markets Index. And the black line here is the US dollar. So in 2002, which we talked a lot about on this call, uh, 
the dollar was stronger than ever and emerging markets were in multi-decade lows relative to the S&P and in absolute terms. And then as soon as that dollar started to come off the boil in 2002, you started this multi-year rally where emerging market index was up 450% and you had many 10 and 20 baggers uh, within those indexes. Then you saw, uh, so it kept, kept rising until the dollar bottomed, the dollar rallied and emerging markets collapsed. Then the dollar uh, uh, rolled back over in 2009, emerging markets recovered and, and rallied like crazy. Um, and then it just, all, both of them grinded sideways for years. Then the dollar started strengthening again, emerging markets sold off, the dollars topped, stopped going up and then collapsed and then created a huge rally in emerging markets and so on and so forth. So the correlation is pretty damn strong. It's almost 100%. Uh, and uh, here you had the absolute low in emerging markets last October when the dollar peaked and now it's come off the boil. Over the last year, we had a counter trend rally over the summer doing due to the debt crisis and other issues. And that's why the emerging markets has been grinding sideways because the dollar has been grinding sideways. As that dollar resumes its downtrend, uh, emerging markets is gonna take its next leg up. So uh, pretty excited about that. And yes, you are correct. Hi, Tom, you've discussed Estee Lauder a few times in the past few months. It's a stock price been a falling knife, but as someone who's worked in consumer products with beauty brands, I know that ELs, this is from Martin Flor Floriani, I know that EL brands are a mainstay in the global beauty category, whether it's online or brick and mortar. Is it attractive enough yet to make a play on your risk reward spectrum? Citing last week's quote, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Um, I think you, you definitely have a good point here. Um, Martin, let's take a, a quick look here at some of this stuff so you can see for yourself why Estee Lauder is dropping a lot is because it's considered a, tri a, China, a China play. And I think that um, you have to believe that China is going to turn hard for Estee Lauder to turn hard. And we happen to believe that. But we have our that view expressed as a cleaner, pure play through Alibaba. Uh, so we wouldn't double down because the correlation is too high. Uh, to have a major position in Estee Lauder, but we'd certainly consider it because it is a super high quality business that's oversold here. And we can just start to look at some of the numbers. Um, I think when you look at their cash flow generation over time, it's going to blow your mind. Um, I don't know why I've had such a tough time with this thing lately. Let's try that. Okay, it, it worked. All right, free cash flow per share. So it was going straight up and now it's, it's weakened since uh, 2021 was the peak and that's why the stock is rolling over. Uh, that's a function of the shutdowns. So let's take a look at the longer term. Actually, maybe I have a, just to get a quicker view here, because we are running long on time. If I pulled a sheet on them. Yeah, Estee Lauder. Okay, so, um, so you can see cash flow and earnings peaked in 2021 and 2022, and then completely collapsed in half. The stock is more than collapsed in half. It's down by, it looks like, uh, 70%, 65, 70% in that ballpark. Um, I mean, the issue with these stocks, so the issue with this is, if you take the long view of this company, It'll work to new highs probably over the next five to seven years. The question is whether it starts from $100 or it starts from $75 or $50. And the answer to that question is no one knows. Um, so you have to look at how clear is the reacceleration story and to get comfort in that because it has been a compounder over time and it just seems like what you have to figure out is, is this all China? Because China was actually shut down and it was once in a hundred year event. 
And is, is, are they starting to recover? What is management saying on the calls? What are they seeing? Because quite a lot of the companies that are reporting in China are actually report, shooting the lights out. Uh, so when you see these one-offs that aren't as good as expected, you say they blame China, but you can't really blame China. Number one, they're growing GDP at 5%. And quite a few of the companies that are reporting that have business in China are reporting well. So why is Estee Lauder not doing well? And what's going to change to get them back on their long-term trend of cash flow growth? And right now, that is an open-ended question. So to get confidence to build a large position, I do think it makes sense to have some position in this, but not a super large, like a Baba-sized position in this, um, until you have absolute confidence of what's the imminent catalyst to turn around. I think this is probably going to turn around sooner than later as China turns around, uh, which I think is going to be sooner than later and could be catalyzed, you know, by uh, this persistent move in the dollar and then some geopolitical catalysts and um, uh, other things that are all lined up and sentiment got washed out. All the other things, I think this is going to trade like BABA, which is why I wouldn't overweight it because I already own a lot of BABA. So, um, and this is as high a quality of business as BABA. It just has less outs because it's concentrated in one line, whereas BABA, you've got Costco, you've got the largest financial services business in Asia, you've got uh, the best cloud growth business, you've got the Amazon uh, retailer, you've got their international business. I mean, there's so many outs and high quality businesses embedded in BABA. It's like six incredible companies in one, whereas this, you live and die on when does the freight, you know, the makeup uh, cycle turn, the luxury makeup cycle turn in China. And uh, I think it's going to be sooner than most people expect. And I like the idea. I think it's okay, but you got to get comfort with the catalyst and, the, and to, to get comfort, you got to do the diligence, but a good question and good find. Sylvan and good company. Sylvan Zerbriggen. Hi, Tom. I'm looking for an entry in the long-term silicon carbide trend, the most famous names in the space, Wolfspeed, on semi STM Micro have crashed recently due to a weak short-term outlook. Still, they don't seem cheap enough, especially Wolf Speed is a big question mark as profitability is not there yet. So I looked for smaller names and found Gem. Amtec System, it supplies semiconductor equipment for these growing niches, but seems to fly under the radar so far. Products are really no joke. Valuation suppressed. EPS is expected to explode. And Insiders bought recently, decently this year. Any thoughts on this stock and the carbon, uh, silicon carbide situation in general? Cheers and thanks for the podcast. Um, as a generalist, I tend to stick to the highest quality in a dislocated sector. Uh, I don't generally play in these type of names. As a matter of fact, I pulled up Wolf Speed. I thought that's what you were asking about, but um, I'm not familiar with this. Uh, let me see, gem, uh, potential gem, Amtex Systems, A-M-T-E-C-H. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, I, I don't love stocks like this. That you know, if they've done nothing for 40 years, it tells me that it's just a garbage business. I mean, every now and then you'll find one that. You know, they get a new management team and they figure out a new vertical to go into. And they, but usually it's a cultural embedded thing in a company. If they haven't worked for three decades, they're not going to work moving forward. So uh, I'll save you some time there. But let's just look at the numbers and see why this business never really takes off. Uh, no matter what the cycle is, they just seem to suck always. Um, ASYS. All right, so they're not generating cash. That that for me is a no. I'll leave that to others to guess as whether they're going to be great or not. I mean, there was actually, it's interesting. There was an insider buy of a million dollars. I put it in the reads this morning for Lumentum Technologies, which is the old CenturyLink, which went bankrupt once. 
And I was like, wow, you know, this CEO put a million dollars of her own money in the stock. It collapsed down to $1. Uh, what did she see that I see? And so I looked at her background and she has an impressive background. Everything's good on paper, except for the fact that she's never run anything. Uh, she was a high level employee at Microsoft. She was a high level management consultant, but she's actually never rolled up her sleeves and run anything. Uh, but she's writing a million dollar check. So, uh, you know, I got out of her own pocket. Uh, so I have to take a look. And I just literally couldn't get there because of the amount of debt on the balance sheet. Now, it's quite possible that she sees something that I can't see, which is um, which is one of the things we saw with Cooper Standard, which was there were enough assets on the balance sheet that could be sold before there was a real bankruptcy risk, uh, which is why she's buying the equity. The other thing it could be is that um, you know she got more than that in terms of the signing bonus. So rather than let the stock collapse to the floor and have no chance of refinancing the debt, go in with what was basically free money to you and your sinus bonus, stick it in the market, try to send a false signal to the market so you get some buyers in so you can refinance some debt. That's being the cynical view, but it's, you know, I've seen a few things in my day. Uh, or, you know, three, um, she just wants to believe. But if you look at the balance sheet, relative to the cash on the balance sheet, relative to the outlook for the business, um, unless there's an imminent sale of assets that's not public at the moment, um, that would create massive liquidity and cause the stock to go up just on the way it's operating, I, I, you know, it's, it's inactionable um, on that. Now, if it was a different CEO who had turned around a lot of stuff and run stuff in the past and put their money there, I'd, I'd have more confidence. But look, everyone needs a first time. Maybe this is going to be her first time. Uh, but um, uh, these are some just nuances that you learn over time where the odds are in your favor. You you bet alongside a, a partner. Uh, but, you know, sometimes they just you know, they just make mistakes and, and there's nothing there that gives me clear confidence that um, there's an edge that, that I'd want to be a partner. So looking at this one, so what I'm saying is insider buying is not always a great tell. You got to see what the jockey has done historically and then decide if it's worth betting alongside them. Do, do they have a history of creating multi-baggers? And in this case, the answer is absolutely not. I mean, it, history of doing well at high paying jobs when they're told what to do. Now we get to see if they can actually run their own show. And um, and that's something that has to be proven out. I, I hope that that's the case. And I hope that she turns that 1 million into 20 million. Um, but I'm not, I'm not gonna take the bet alongside because I don't have the perfect information that she has or doesn't have. Um, this is just showing me a history of inconsistency i mean the top line it's like it's like they're every day they're trying to find their next meal there's no consistent trend growth uh which is consistent with their long-term chart it's just this like let's try to get a contract this week so we can stay open another year uh i don't like these type of businesses i would steer clear of it uh maybe you get lucky and it bounces from 6 to 18 but on the basis of nothing other than uh, shares available versus short-term demand and headlines. This is, you know, cash flow negative. This is the absolute, uh, don't know how to compound capital. So this is not the type of business that I'd be in. If you're going to be in semiconductors, you got to bet with a winner. Gelsinger was mentored by Andy Grove, who invented uh, Silicon Valley. He uh, was responsible for the 486 architecture. This is a guy you want to bet with. He's a winner. And, uh, and that's already being seen in its early days, just on the PC business uh, that's coming back now that inventories are worked down, you got a $55, $60 stock. And if all the promises about advanced chips and foundries come true, it could be a hundred dollars plus so, um, or more, we'll see as it gets higher. So, um, so uh, thanks for the question, Sylvan. I'm gonna take a pass on this one, but keep looking. You'll, as you listen more and learn kind of the framework, you'll find better and better quality companies over time. Uh, but uh, certainly thanks for sending that in and, and supporting the, uh, the podcast. Uh,
hedge fund tips and golf tips with Tom Hayes. All right, Kayla Smith. Uh, hi, Tom. CPS is doing wonderful. Congrats! Exclamation point. Today, if if this was sent today, who knows what they would say? All right. Uh, a few weeks ago, I asked about Spirit Arrow Systems. Okay, yeah, that's one that uh, I thought you did a good job on. I said take it for a trade. Uh, it's rallying since then. What's your opinion on the TLT idea? TLT, we talked about uh, several weeks back that um, uh, bonds are going up, yields are going down, and they're doing that, uh, and I think that's going to persist. Um, Okay, so she says, is it as simple as it sounds or really ill-advised buying TLT at multi-year lows? Powell is done with rate cuts and we've hit peak or near peak or one hike left, TLT will be at near bottom prices. Well, it's up, I think it's up about seven or 8% over the last week. By buying a position in TLT now, it can be held and during that time will yield 3%. Uh, it'll yield more than that. And it'll go up when rates get cut and can be held sleeping soundly at night. And here's another question, an odd one. Okay, so that wasn't a question, that's your statement. Number one, it yields more than that. Number two, that's correct. Number three, sleep soundly, I mean, if you have a 20 year horizon, I guess, but um, nothing's guaranteed. I mean, if rates go the other way, then it'll drop. So no, it's not a guarantee, nothing's a guarantee, but the odds are in our favor based on the positioning, based on everything else that we've covered over recent weeks. What's your analysis opinion on Li Ning? Uh, it's, uh, Reed, Reed is China's Nike. I'll never buy anything other than the top three companies, top three or four companies in China. I don't look at any uh, companies that um, are not huge in China because basically I'm saying if they destroy those, they destroy themselves. If leaning goes out of business, no one cares. Um, so I, I just passed because you got to make sure that the numbers are accurate. You got to make sure that the accounting is done correct, you, correctly. You got to make sure that the government's incentives are to keep them in business and not take them out if they don't like uh, the leader of the company. Uh, it's just a different environment. You're not just dealing with it as a company. So I would pass on that. Uh, congrats on your Spirit Arrow systems from a few weeks ago. I remember that. That was a good find. And uh, keep up the good work. Bob Johnson. So uh, to answer your question, we own uh, TLT and some of the newer accounts uh, that funded uh, through October. Uh, Bob Johnson, uh, listen to the earnings call on CPS and have a couple questions. Number one, roughly 7% of the Cooper Standard float is short interest. Is that significant enough to warrant further evaluation or not enough to matter? Uh, it could be 27%. It would make zero difference for me. Number two, um, those are the first buyers as it goes up. So it's probably now down to 4% once the numbers get updated after last week's squeeze. Number two, under what potential circumstances would your firm step in to become an activist investor, assuming your firm owns sufficient shares to do so? Well, one, we own more than sufficient shares to do so. And two, why would we become an activist with the managements doing everything that we would want to do and doing it way better than we could ever do ourselves. Like, why would you do that? If, now, if you're dealing with price, then, you know, today you would step in and say, well, is the stock down 10%? Like, like that's not what we do. Um, if we have a problem with management, we'll dump a half a million shares on their head and say goodbye. But if we, um, they continue to execute, we have absolute and utter confidence with their ability to execute uh, with their ability to deliver, they've done it through the worst in a once in a hundred year event. They've been able to hold things together against all odds last last fall when the credit markets were closed. They're taking out costs. They're delivering value. It's it's a function of you can't activist against industry volumes. If the volumes go up, we're going to make more money than God. Uh, I mean, you know, as a figure of speech. Uh, and we we believe that the conditions are set. Average car on the road, thirteen years. Uh, largest percentage of the population, 33, housing family formation, um, uh, financing advantage because of captive uh, captive financing companies that can offer zero to 2.9 against the used car market, which is nine to 11. Everything mm -hmm. is in our direction. And we're seeing that reflected. You know, I said my, my comment on Twitter after they reported earnings was, I expected these results from Cooper Standard uh, period. I just thought it would take 24 months for them to get to this point. So that's where we are. They're running ahead of schedule, doing a great job. You would never be an activist against 
uh, management that's doing a phenomenal job in the most adverse of conditions. Um, and, um, and that's, that's not our game anyway. We, we, life, life is too short for that. If, if you're not satisfied, number one, we wouldn't have gotten involved in the company if we weren't comfortable with management beforehand. And number two, if they didn't deliver, we would just exit and move on to something else. There's no need, reason to stick around and, you know, argue with these people. There's too many other great things to do. Um, Jason Zen, I want to thank you for your weekly stellar content. I tune in to over 10 investment and macro podcasts and your podcast video cast is distinctly number one, not by choice, but by value. And I continue to share it where possible. Um, well, thank you very much. It's very kind to hear. I put in a lot of work to these things and a lot of time. Uh, I listened to the CPS earnings call and was surprised that only one party asked a question. Is that normal or just indicative of a small cap talk? That is normal of the greatest opportunities available. When no one is covering the stock, when there's no institutional sponsorship because they all got flushed out, uh, and when it's inflecting, uh, those are the best times because markets are quote unquote efficient. Um, but when no one's covering and when no one's paying attention is the best time when you can buy those in, buy these great businesses at inefficient dislocated prices. And that's what we were able to do last May when there was probably zero questions on the conference call at that point. And as the price moves up to $20 and $30 and $40, you're gonna to start to see more institutional sponsorship, more sell side coverage, uh, and, um, and more questions on the conference call. And when the conference call gets crowded with uh, 10 or 15 sell side people, we'll probably be laying off stock on a quarterly basis until we're out of the, out of the business. And uh, hopefully that's many years henceforth. Um, as they, as they deliver the goods. Darwin Nunez, um, trying to understand VF Corp thesis, but can't seem to buy into a company with dying brands such as Vans and Timberland. Do they have similar, rev they do have similar revenue to 2020 though. What price target do you have? Okay, so this is a, fo uh, so number one, thanks for the question. Number two, as you listen longer to the podcast, you'll learn the difference between price and value. Um, when you say dying brands, I, I think you're, missing the boat uh, or focused exclusively on your experience of the world around you. But when you look at Europe and Asia and China, they're growing like a weed and uh, particularly North Face is doing exceptionally well. Uh, Vans is doing better abroad than it's doing here. Uh, Timberland certainly doing better. Um, um, but in the US, Vans is, has not been doing well. And that's why he changed the uh, management, number one. Uh, number two, they're installing the platform that's working well in Europe, in the US. They're gonna sell off the PAX business, East PAC and Jan Sports, delever the balance sheet. Uh, and then, you know, once they've done that, then they can either start to acquire new brands, dispose underperforming brands, uh, bringing the right people to rejuvenize uh, the brands. Um, um, and then as far as uh, price target, I think it's going to change. I, I don't want to bet against this guy, as you heard in the Fox uh, clip with Liz Clayman, because this is a guy who does have a track record of turning things around. And he had a 26 bagger with Logicorp, which is not a great business, by the way. He just made it a great business um, or Logitech. Um, so, you know, I'd start to take a look at this when it gets to $40, I'd start to say, okay, is he delivering on the turnaround plan and are the financials and cash flow improving such that I want to stay with this business for a long time? Or is this a trade and the business is still garbage and he's not getting any traction? But it is going to recover on the uh, peak narrative thesis and the ability to refinance and delever thesis and the stock will get a lot of short covering and it will shoot up to $30, $40. And then we'll see if he's delivering on the fundamentals. And if he's delivering on the fundamentals, we probably wanna own it for a while uh, and a lot higher than that. But you have to see each step of the way, where are they in terms of what they said and what they did and then um, manage accordingly. Paul Gertz, um, have you ever looked at Buckle? Caught my eye the other day as I saw high insider ownership and high uh, return on equity each year with zero debt. It's been the case consistently for a number of years. Looks like they dividend out all the free cash flow. Just thought their numbers looked interesting. 
considering they're a retailer. Any thoughts you have on it would be great to hear. Thanks again for all you do, Paul. Um, yeah, uh, again, I, I tend to go for the highest quality. This one reminds me a bit of um, Best Buy, which also looks like a great business, but it's still a retailer no matter how, how you slice it. Um, uh, buckle, let's see, I don't even know what the ticker, uh, BKE, okay. Okay, so it's up from eight to 45 bucks uh, off the pandemic lows. And let's check back here a little bit. Uh, let's see here. So, yeah, they seem to, seem to keep growing. Their margins seem to be improving. Their earnings look okay. Let's see, the balance sheet looks good. Cash flow, generating free cash. Yeah, I think, you know, I'd love to buy it at a lot lower prices. I think that, um, you know, the time you want to buy these is like when they're down 50 plus percent and their fundamentals are still holding in there, like you saw during this period when no one wanted it. I think you're not going to get hurt with this over time. It's probably going to be fine. I personally just wouldn't buy it up at this level because it, it is, it's still a retailer, uh, which is not a, a, a super business. So for me to buy that type of business, I really need to see it dislocated. And then when it's dislocated, I need to see it have fundamentals like this, like they're going to stay in business, uh, even though the price is dislocated. And um, right now things are kind of fine. You know, it's pulled back a little bit, but it's just not enough margin of safety. There's not enough juice in the trade. I, I don't want something that I'm going to have a 10% IRR for the next five years because, or, you know, doubles over the next seven years. It's it's not really helpful. It doesn't really move the needle, but good business, good fundamentals, good find. Drew Byrne, uh, grateful for your thoughts on Gray TV at current valuations for a smaller investment. It hasn't been pulling up tree cash flow wise, but not awful either. It has a significant long term debt of 6.5 billion. Earnings outlook looks a little rosier and reducing rate environment next 12 to 24 months could help. It's a little hairy with no major catalyst. So I'm erring on doing nothing currently and doing more work, but wondered if I'm missing something. Uh, twice in the past year, I passed up a small size investment in Broxham due to the country company and financial risk. It tends to trade options intermittently, but I felt it was too risky. Um, appreciate these are hairier than usual, but hoping to get some further clarity. All right. so. I, I'm, I'm not going to really speak to Gray. All I can say about, because um, I, I just can't speak on this one. What, what I can say is the key to this stock is if you, uh, no, well, I would say a couple of things. Number one, these things tend to do well during political season. So the advertising should be good in the political election next year. But that said, you have to look at who owns the stock. And if you do enough deep, diligence research, you may figure out, I I personally would just pass on this. So um, I can't give you an objective answer on that one, but um, I would, I would uh, let me just see what she said. Braxem, B-R-A-S-K-E-M, um, B-R-A-S-K-E-M. Okay, let's take a look at this one. BAK. I don't know why this won't pull up. Ask him. Okay. 
All right, so these guys are cash flow is cutting, cash flow is coming down a lot. What's their free cash flow look like? Negative. What's, what's their bit balance sheet look like? Is this in dollars? No. Oh, okay. So this is the, this is country risk. So you're looking for a play on Brazil. Um, Nine billion of debt, two billion of cash. Cash flow statement is nine thirty. All right, free cash flow is negative at the moment. Balance sheet is so so. Revenues are a little weak. And what's happening here? What is this business? Is this a commodity business? It sells thermoplastic resins. Yeah, it's chemical, uh, liquefied petroleum gas. Yeah, I don't love commodity companies except when the, 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 they're just completely destroyed. I mean, this one's probably okay. I, th this is, it's not going out of business. It generates cash for the most part. Uh, it's going to be very cyclical. It's not a good quality business, but it probably works for a trade up to, you know, went back up to 20 bucks over the next few years, but there are better businesses and then you're going to pay ordinary income if it does it over the next 12 months. Uh, but, you know, probably an interesting find. Sorry, I can't say much more on gray. There are things, that, anyway, so that's where that is. Uh, but thank you as always, Drew. You always come up with good questions, good finds, and I appreciate your consistent support. Ivor Barry, uh, thoughts on Paycom Software and Massimo Corp at these levels? Um, you know, Paycom is, yeah, Paycom's too new for me. And I, I don't like these that have already had run, run ups without me just because they're down a little bit. They, when they collapse, they tend to just super, this is a Momo stock, uh, and it's probably going to, it could work its way down a lot lower. Um, this is destroyed. You're going to see institutions just puking out of this thing for a long time. And there, it doesn't have any history of operating through different cycles. This reminds me of Zim, that shipping company that was pitched to me uh, at the top and, and completely collapsed. Um, you know, look, margins are improving, but I would just stay away from this one for right now. If it goes down like 80, 90%, I would, I would definitely revisit it maybe at a hundred or $50. It may never get there. It could just put in a base here and go back up and I'll miss it. I'm, I'm okay with errors of omission, just not errors of commission. Let's just take a look at the financials real quick. I'm sure. They were great when it was going parabolic. All right. So things are earning five bucks. What about cash flow? Yeah, I mean, it's generating free cash. Let's see. Strong return on capital. It looks like a good business. Let's see if there's any debt. Um, yeah, look, everything looks right. The problem is it's a busted growth stock. So... Send it back to me in six months on the, on the AMA. It'll probably be, my guess is it'll be somewhere between 100 and 150 bucks. It's probably going to take a few years to build a base and then it could eventually get back to new highs. This does look like a decent quality business, but I don't think this is going to recover right away. You don't see after their 50 baggers that they just, you know, correct a little bit and then recover. It, this is broken for some reason and uh, you got to dig into why. Um, as for Massimo... And, and oftentimes it's not apparent just looking at the rear view mirror numbers. You got to understand why is everyone puking out of it? So Massimo is another one uh, that was, you know, multi-bagger. And it's very interesting. I get a lot of these people get so infatuated like Enphase. 
they the recency bias well it went up so much so quickly now i can get it cheaper but by the time the this is this is probably broken for a while uh even though the numbers are going to look good um let's see here masi All right, so their their cash flow is burning down. They have a lot of debt. Not much. I mean, they got a billion dollars of debt, a hundred million dollars of cash. That's not the end of the world. Um, cash flow operations is light, and they are burning cash. So free cash flow negative, not good. And what's happening to the revenue? So it looks like they probably did a big acquisition here because revenues jumped. And like all big acquisitions, they probably take some time to digest. The synergies weren't as high as they expected. And now everyone's puking out. Earnings have collapsed from $4 a share to a buck 63. This one's going to take a while. Maybe all the worst of it's priced in, but you're going to give it a few months. I mean, even if this is where it's going to bottom, it's probably going to take a, you know, a year or so to build a base and then uh, work higher. My guess is you get a chance to buy it lower. Uh, that's without, you know, that's just a cursory look here. Uh, Hopeful as well. Definitely jealous of all the golf pictures from Florida. How's the putter working for you? Uh, looking at FMC. Actually, I was really striking the ball extremely well with Gene and, and Mike and Ryan. Um, my short game was a little weak inside 100 yards, but um, it's usually okay. So I'm not, I'm not terribly worried. And it was nice to be striking the ball extremely well. So... All right, looking at FMC down seven months in a row, sales have declined slightly, but the price has gotten chopped by 60%. Look at Scott's Miracle Grow and Mosaic. Looks like the industry's down. Focusing on FMC because their margin, margins really haven't changed during this price drop. Curious your thoughts on that industry and FMC. I kind of like SMG, to be honest with you. Scott's Miracle Grow. Um, let's take a look at FMC. Yeah, I think um, I mean they're growing earnings per share, cash flow per share, revenue per share. They're buying in shares, I guess. Yeah, they're bringing the share count down. Sales were weak this year. They're expected to recelerate next year. So to your point, they've historically been a decent compounder. Uh, solutions to growers, crop protection, plant health, blah, blah, blah. This is probably a better quality business than Scott's Miracle Grow, but I think Scott's probably has a better margin of safety. I think it's collapsed a bit more. Uh, yeah, and already started to put it in its base. So I think both of them are probably going to be fine. I think this is a pretty good find. It'll just take a little while, but uh, I think if you take the long view on that, you're going to be okay. Obviously, do more work. I'm taking a two-minute look at it, but I have been looking at the group and uh, I think you're spot on. So good work with that, uh, Paul. Okay, Stephen Frampton, uh, thanks for taking our questions. A month or so I asked an AMA about alternative asset managers. You were looking at Brook Brookfield Corp. Notice in your show notes for Charles Payne, you had plans to mention BN and Crown Castle as rate decrease beneficiaries. Uh, wondering your thoughts on BN. They report better than expected numbers today. I'm pretty bullish on them. Uh, I'll be listening every week. Yeah, I like Brookfield. Good management. Uh, historically good. Got beat down with uh, kind of the whole group. And um, I think they're okay. Pretty high quality business. Not a big enough margin of safety for me to get excited about it, but I think they're okay. Ronan Bitten uh, would like your opinion on BFH. Um... All right, let's see what that is. Oh, Bread Financial. Um, yeah, I looked at this. Um, these are not for me because this is payment and lending solutions. This reminds me of like Lending Club and all the others that were that just blew up in the last cycle they're so opaque and there's no way I can tell what they own. And if we are going into a s slower growth environment, these marginal type loans that they service are going to have the most problems. And there's no way for you to tell what their default rates are, et cetera. So while it looks like a great business that can keep growing and you can buy it at a good price, you have no idea what they're holding. And uh, for me, it's just a pass because there, there's too much opacity in that type of uh, business. Um, basically, uh, 
Digital pain and enjoyment of the LLT. Um, let me just take a little closer look and make sure I know what I'm talking about before I say that. Yeah, interest in dividend income. Yeah, I, Oh, they do generate a lot of cash. Um, credit card and other loan financing services. Let's see. Credit card programs, bread partnerships. Cash back credit. Manages and services the loans it originates. Installment loans, uh, marketing, and only. Yeah. <sighs> the reason I shy away from this, it, and the other thing is, and it could be perfectly fine, but the other issue I have is I haven't seen, I would love to see that how this business operated through the great financial crisis because. You know, they haven't been tested yet. No, that's not it. Bread Financial, what is it? B-R-E-A-T. B-F-H. Oh, this has been around for a while. Huh. I think I got to spend some more time on this one. This looks interesting, uh, Ronan. Let me just take a look here. B F H. All right, so let's see how far back I can go. The business keeps growing. Now they built the business in a 0% interest rate environment. So now we have to see how it happened, how it operates under stress. And to do that, I'm gonna have to do a lot more work than looking at historic data. And that's the real risk. Um, but I do like the fact that it made it through the great financial crisis in a financial business and it made it through the tech wreck or got started in the tech wreck. Um, so I'm going to say. That I'm interested in doing more work, but I can't say yes or no based on everything here. I mean, it's you can see the stock is pricing that they have subprime exposure uh, and they're going to take hits. The question is, has it priced in a worst case scenario? Um, so I'm inside banks, concerns over general health of the lending industry. She could provide for tuck-in purchases. Um, Ronan, I think this is definitely worth doing more work on. Uh, I'd get on the last eight conference calls, read the last two or three annual reports for starters, look at the investor presentation, try to understand what is their risk exposure. But um, assuming the balance sheet looks okay, let me just see. This in US dollars, yes. So $3.3 billion of cash. Four billion of long-term debt. Uh, also, they have deposits. So you gotta see what are they paying? What is their cost of funds? Per share. 
I'm interested in this one. I'm going to do more work on it. I think uh, I think you found something interesting there, Ronan. All right, Jason Reed. No specific question today, just a few comments. While the podcast and video cast are exceptional, I also want to point out the outstanding content in the commentary that comes out the day before. This week's edition is so packed and really highlights the amount of work that goes into each edition. Thank you for all of your hard work. The education I've received over the last one and a half years is really priceless. It has encouraged me to drastically improve my reading and dig deeper into topics I don't understand. My investment process has significantly changed. Just want you to know that the hard work is noticed and appreciated. We'll continue to trumpet your site. Jason Reed, San Antonio, Texas. Jason, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for your support. I'm glad it's been helpful to you. And for everyone else, uh, be like Jason, who shares the site with his friends. Uh, the more people we share with, the longer we're going to keep doing this for everyone else, uh, uh, free for the public. It'll always be for the clients. And um, uh, just grateful for everyone tuning in. Uh, we'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.